Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Favorite Plants for Southern California Gardens. We are going to get started. My name is Scott Kleinrock. I will be your instructor today. A couple of quick notes before we get started. This presentation is available for download. If you would like to download the slides, we're going to be going through lots of plant profiles. There is a website I'll be showing you with really detailed information about all of these plants, but there's some quick bullet points that might be useful for your reference or if you aren't able to jot things down as we go through some of the favorite plants and why I recommend them. So you can get this whole presentation as a single PDF where each slide is one page and you can get that at the top link here on this slide, cbwcd.org slash presentations. And I'm going to type that into the chat now in case you need to refer to it later. So it's presentations. And so if you go to that site, that's just a list of download links to all of the online workshops that we teach or some of our past in-person workshops, uh, the slides of those as well. So just scroll through that list and find, it's actually going to say favorite plants for Inland Valley Gardens. We've just changed the title of the workshop because most of these plants work great across Southern California, even if they're not in the Inland Valley. So you can find the Inland Valley, favorite plants for Inland Valley Gardens uh, PDF and download it. And it's the exact same presentation. And this is also being recorded. So after some light editing probably next week this is going to be posted to our online workshop youtube page at cbwcd.org youtube which has recordings of all of our past online workshops so i'm going to put that into the chat right now as well cd.org youtube and even immediately if you want to review some of the content there is a recording of the last time i taught this workshop with uh, pretty much identical content so you can get access to that right away. So before we get going, I'm going to tell you just briefly a little bit about who we are and what we do from my agency. We are the WaterWise Community Center. The formal name of our agency is the Chino Basin Water Conservation District. We are a special district, similar to a school mm -hmm. district or a fire district, that was created by a public vote back in 1949 to provide water conservation services to the western edge of San Bernardino County. So from the communities of Rancho Cucamonga and Upland in the north through uh, Montclair, Ontario, Chino, and Chino Hills in the south. And so we say that our mission is threefold, to percolate, to demonstrate, and to educate. Percolation, as you can see here on the right, has long been the bread and butter of our agency. We own and operate in coordination with other local water agencies, a series of large percolation basins, most of which are literally old gravel pits, which have been re-engineered and reconfigured to take stormwater that would otherwise leave our communities during rain events and to, through natural processes, clean and infiltrate it to recharge our local groundwater supply, which is 60% roughly of our local water supply. So very important resource in our area. Uh, but on the demand side of water conservation, we also know that it's not that useful to do all of that work unless people are using water wisely when it comes time to actually use it. And so to that end, we have a free demonstration garden facility. We have about three acres of demonstration landscapes of all sorts of different water-wise styles and things you can do at home. It is at our headquarters facility in Montclair, which is just south of the 10 freeway. And you can come visit for free uh, Monday through Saturday from 8 a.m. till 4.45 p.m. So please come check us out if you haven't been here. And then we do lots of education for all sorts of different groups from curriculum integrated K through 12 programming to education uh, both online and we are increasingly moving back into in-person workshops in our garden. So through spring and summer, most of our programs are going to be here in our garden at the WaterWise Community Center, as well as a variety of other programs for a variety of other audiences, including training landscape professionals in aspects of WaterWise gardening. And so I personally am Scott Kleinrock, for those of you who just joined, I am the Conservation Programs Manager here at the WaterWise Community Center. 
And the reason why I'm talking to you about this subject today is because this is really kind of at the heart of uh, what I do. I've been working in the landscape industry in various aspects in Southern California for about 16 years now, and that's included everything from uh, landscape maintenance, lots of landscape design. I have a master's degree in landscape architecture from Cal Poly Pomona, and I worked for eight years doing design, construction management, horticulture management in the public gardens world before I came about five years ago to the Waterwise Community Center, Chino Basin Water Conservation District. But through that whole time, the really favorite aspect of the stuff I do has been uh, working with uh, normal people, community members, homeowners on kind of re-envisioning what we can do with the landscapes that we have right around us in our urban and suburban areas of Southern California. So every single plant I'm going to show to you today uh, is a plant that I have grown, that I love for specific reasons because of my experience with those plants, designing with planting and maintaining those plants. And where that I have learned through that experience, uh, they work really well in our residential landscapes in Southern California. So you're not gonna be hearing anything that I like read from a book and put on a slide. This is based on kind of what I do uh, every day in my life. And I'm excited to share some of that with you because this is stuff that's uh, hard to read in books and it's hard to really understand even with really good online resources or plant profiles exactly how you might best use it in the garden. And so that's really going to be our structure for today. And I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because I have a slide that kind of goes through the structure. But yeah, I'm really excited to share this information with you. And so with that, very quickly, before we jump into it, I am going to ask you to tell me just a little bit about yourselves in this opening poll, which helps us get our metrics and tracking for this program so we can continue to offer free programs like this. So please just very quickly select the relevant answers, and then we will jump into it. Looks like most people have finished. There's just a few left. We'll give it just another moment or so. And while people are finishing up, I will let you know the best way to interact with me today. We actually have a uh, bit of a smaller group than we normally do for our online workshops. It hasn't been that long since we taught this topic and it is a beautiful morning in Southern California. So I think a lot of people are actually out doing gardening. So that's great for you all because we should have more capacity to answer everybody's questions than we sometimes do. So we don't, or I don't have people raise their hands and call on them and have them uh, unmute their microphone and talk into and ask their questions because we find that there's a lot of technical issues with that in downtime. So the best way to ask questions and for me to keep them organized and make sure that I respond to everybody's question is to use the Q&A function in your Zoom window. And so you will see a number of different buttons that you could press or that you could click on in your Zoom window. And one of them says Q&A and has two text bubbles. And that's the one to answer questions with. Because when you type questions into there, as opposed to the chat, that goes into a separate window that on the back end that you can't see makes it very easy for me to keep all the questions answered and to check them off as I answer them. And I can keep an eye on that as they come in. And so what I will be doing is keeping an eye on that. And as questions come in, either pausing between sections of the workshop 
or if it's relevant to a specific plant I'm talking about, uh, stop and answer right there. If you have any comments, uh, feel free to put those into the chat. I always read all of those at the end and sometimes catch up with those in between different sections. Uh, but uh, questions that go into the chat sometimes get lost. So please put your questions into the Q&A. Laura has just done this and that let me see this right away. Uh, so Laura, who just joined. Yes, this workshop is being recorded and shared. If you scroll to the top of the chat, I typed two links in. The first one is where you can look for the title of the presentation and download a PDF file of all of the slides. And the second one is where this recording after light editing is going to be posted on our YouTube uh, workshop channel. But there is already a recording of the previous time I taught this workshop if you want access to it before the updated version goes up. Okay, and so thank you very much for joining us, everybody. We are going to finish up the poll and get going. And so the first thing I want to just kind of take on right out the door is this is not what we are talking about today. And that's not to put this person down. Uh, we have seen a lot of landscapes that look like this going in Southern California over the past eight to 10 years because people feel like they are doing the right thing. And so, you know, that's, is what it is. And part of why my agency does the education we do is because we want kind of beautiful balanced landscapes to replace, be replacing uh, high water landscapes as they go in our communities, things that will really add to the daily life of the people who live at these homes and to the look and feel of the community as well. And one of our big ideas is that evolving to low water landscapes is not a compromise at all. We have so many amazing, dynamic, beautiful plants that grow so well and require little resources here in Southern California uh, that really it's not a compromise at all. And in fact, I firmly and strongly believe, and I've seen it happen in every garden project I've been involved with, that installing the low water landscapes can leave you with just a flat out more pleasurable, better, more beneficial for yourself in the world landscape than the higher water landscapes that they're replacing. So that's kind of the criteria and goal, kind of the minimum entry point for, for what we're talking about when we are talking about this. And it doesn't need to be completely all or nothing. I love this garden because in the background they have this person is probably from the northeast or something like that maybe the northwest and so they have probably an emotional connection and a love of specific higher water use plants and so here we have a japanese maple and a hydrangea high water plants not particularly well adapted to southern california in a garden but the rest of the garden is either california native or very well adapted. And they just took those two plants that they really love, stuck it in the appropriate place, a semi-shady area where they can get watered together. So I'm not here to tell you, you got to go all super low water in order to be a good person. I love growing fruit trees and vegetables. Uh, a decent amount of my backyard is fruit trees and vegetables, but the rest of my property is all low water California native plants and a couple of higher water California native plants right next to a water feature. So you can make this work for yourself. It's not all or nothing. It can be a very floriferous kind of informal style. It can be a drier kind of more desert style if that's what you're into. But I always recommend mixing in some native shrubs for color and to kind of soften the look. It can be a uh, kind of a woodland kind of effect and still be quite low water, or it can be very simple and informal. You don't need to be intimidated at all. If you want to start with uh, taking out your lawn, putting in wood chips, and just selecting a few plants that you really love in an informal style, that's a great place to start. You don't need to drive yourself crazy with details and design. Uh, gardening is not a competition. It should be exciting, fun, and an expression of what you like. And it's just fine to start small and gain confidence. If you know you are going to be wanting to take on a whole yard project in terms of the logistics, if you're redoing irrigation systems and things like that, there's some benefits to it, but there's nothing wrong with just starting at the edges and building on your successes. And if you use your lawn or you know that for a specific reason, you want to continue to maintain part of your lawn, that's fine too. What we encourage people to do is to think about 
how much lawn do you actually use? If you have dogs, if you have a kid who's learning to play soccer or baseball, maybe you do want some lawn. And so we encourage people to think about that. If you don't use the lawn, maybe put in something that's more interesting, requires less work and less maintenance and gives you more benefits. Uh, but for that section that you do, it's also just as important, and we teach other classes about this, to just make sure that your irrigation is set up well, it's being watered appropriately, and that will help both the, the health of all of the plants in your landscape and allow you to do what you need to do. It's really not all or nothing at all. And so here's our outline for today's workshop. We're gonna do a very brief introduction to California native and water-wise plants for Southern California. For those of you who have joined us for other workshops, some of this will be review, but that review is going to be useful. Uh, it kind of builds us up to how to think about plants for your garden, where to research plants, and this is all going to be brief stuff at the beginning, sort of introduction. And then the bulk of the workshop is going to be my favorite plants for home gardens. And it's just gonna be going through kind of scenario by scenario. So things that are kind of harder to understand from the plant list. So for example, what are the plants that can take full blasting reflected heat sun in inland climates, you know, in hot summer afternoons, we're gonna make sure that that's covered. And as we talk about favorite shrubs, favorite uh, trees, favorite, small ground cover plants for around the edges of pathways and things like that. We'll talk about these specific scenarios. We'll spend a whole section on what are those plants that are good on the north side of the house where it's shady a lot of the year, but then full blasting sun when the sun is directly overhead in the summer. All of those little kind of niches. And so as you think about your landscape space and what are the different kind of niches that you need to fill based on sun or shade or size, hopefully you can take this and have a short list of some favorite plant choices. There's lots of other great plants beyond this. It was always hard for me to only choose my favorites, uh, but these are definitely my favorites for uh, the average home gardener. So nothing is particularly difficult to grow as long as you go to nurseries that uh, carry native plants, because most of these, but not all of these, are going to be California native plants. Uh, you, you have a pretty good chance of being able to find them. They're not super rare, obscure things. And then towards the end, we'll talk about where to get these awesome plants and some advice about how to bring this all together and next steps. And so let's get going. And we're going to start with what is a water-wise plant? Because all of these plants are water-wise plants. To me, that's a minimal uh, requirement for being one of my favorite plants for a home garden in Southern California these days. We don't have a lot of water. There's a decent chance that uh, we are going to be moving into an era of increased water restrictions because there is just not a lot of water available to our local areas because of the drought that we are in. And there are so many great plants that don't require much water in the home landscape that that's, you get minimum uh, criteria for entry into making it to this list. So what are water-wise plants? They're plants that love life here in Southern California. And because the WaterWise Community Center is in the inland area, they can also take the inland heat. All of these plants are going to do well if you're more, for example, in our area, in like Los Angeles proper or in Orange County or even more to the coastal areas. Uh, but they can really thrive in our inland heat as well. And what do they have in common? Well, they probably do more for us than the plants they're replacing. The California natives tend to provide valuable habitat for pollinators, birds, and butterflies. Uh, our local beneficial critters have just evolved with most of these plants, and so they have unique relationships. And so by providing these plants that happen to thrive in our gardens, we can also really support our pollinators, birds, and butterflies. And together they make your yard an exciting place where something is always changing. Uh, we have plants that bloom in spring, in summer, in fall, in winter. So many great choices uh, to really create a, a much more dynamic space than the kind of traditional higher water, quote, conventional, more like East Coast style landscapes that uh, were installed for many years as Southern California urbanized and suburbanized. And an important idea is that this area is not a desert. Now, some of the favorite plants on my list are from our local California deserts because they're beautiful and grow really well 
uh, in this area and don't necessarily have that traditional desert look. They're flowering shrubs, a lot of them, or flowering perennial plants. But our area here, if you are in the Inland Empire, if you are in the San Gabriel, San Fernando Valley, Los Angeles area, Orange County, these areas are not deserts. It's dry, but technically we're a semi-arid Mediterranean climate. And even in our drought years where it is really arid and maybe we're headed towards that direction, uh, we're still a Mediterranean climate. We're the driest of the Mediterranean climates, but there's five Mediterranean climates in the world and they are characterized by cool, wet winters and hot, dry summers where the deserts actually get a lot of their rainfall in like wet summer monsoons when they do get rainfall. And so the Mediterranean climates are California, much of California, other than the true desert areas, uh, the Mediterranean itself, part of Australia, part of South Africa, and part of Chile. And so that's why when you think of garden plants beyond our California natives that tend to grow well in water-wise landscapes, a lot of them happen to be from those regions. And they tend to have some pretty similar adaptations to growing in that Mediterranean hot, dry, or dryish climate. And they'll have different adaptations. Sometimes they'll have more than one, but common ones are gray or silver leaves that reflect more of the sunlight than the amount of sunlight and heat darker leaves would absorb. Glossy or leathery leaves, which actually helps the plant from uh, losing as much water as they would if their leaves were thinner or finer. Uh, fuzzy leaves, that fuzz also kind of helps insulate. And sleepy summers, meaning if you grow some of these plants which can totally naturalize after establishment and survive generally not being watered at all, they'll go into a summer dormancy where they'll kind of shrivel up. They might look like they're dead-ish. Uh, it's kind of ecologically their winter, the hot, dry summer is when they don't want to grow. They just kind of go into a holding stage. And so that's part of the adaptation. But because they have that adaptation, how they'll work for us in most garden situations is that all we need to do is give it a bit of water. In most cases, if you're working with native plants, most of the ones or pretty much all of the ones that, that made it onto my favorite plants list, all you need to do to avoid that real deep summer dormancy is to give them a good deep soaking one time per month in the summer. And that will keep them looking a little bit fresher if you want to keep that kind of a little bit of a, a fresher, nicer look and not go into a truly kind of dormant stage. Uh, and so those are kind of the adaptations that a lot of these plants from the Mediterranean climate share. And a cool thing for our gardens in terms of the design and the look of our gardens is that it gives us so much uh, fun stuff to work with, whether it's the light color leaves, almost things from white to silver to light green to dark green to the different textures of the leaves. Uh, you'll see some pictures of the fuzz. So this is uh, my front yard in the morning. And you can see here, this is one of my favorite plants, fragrant pitcher sage. And it literally grows, I mean, does grow, but it literally glows every morning when it's backlit by the early morning sun. And that's all of that fuzz basically creating a glowing halo uh, when it's backlit. And it's even more lovely in person. I've never gotten a picture that really, really kind of shows it as lovely as it actually is. And so there's all these great visual effects that we can play with in our garden because we have all of those drought adaptations, those physiological characteristics. So that's a really neat thing about working with water-wise in California native plants, especially because flowers are transitory. So even though in our native gardens or our water-wise gardens, we can have flowers every month of the year, the, no plant is going to be flowering every single month of the year. And so having these great foliage and form and color contrast that are part of just how the plant looks 365 days of the year uh, is, is really fun in terms of uh, the looks we can achieve with our garden. And then the flowers are just the icing on the cake. And so we're going to do just a brief walk in terms of what does this look like? Well, if it's not the desert, you know, what can our inspiration be? 
And I like to look at our local wild plant communities. And we go way deeper into this in our California native garden design class. And you can check out the recording on our YouTube page. Uh, but just to kind of take a quick look. So these are wild landscapes. So our home landscapes are gonna to want to be more managed, but just the range of looks that without any irrigation at all will grow wild in Southern California from oak woodlands to chaparral. So these are steep dry slopes up in the San Gabriel mountains. But again, look at the density of the plant cover. There's a lot of plants and actually quite a bit of green much of the year. Uh, Oak Savanna grasslands. This is inland San Diego County at the Santa Rosa Plateau, actually Riverside County. Uh, absolutely lovely. And part of the reason why we should really be considering this is because it turns out that tree ring records show that California became a state and was largely built out and urbanized during historically what was a pretty wet period, but even without climate change as a factor, and it is, we could just naturally be going into kind of a, a more average period or a drier period and compounded with climate change, uh, it, we should expect things to be pretty dry. We'll, we will have dry years and wet years, but it is looking like we are going into more of a drought phase. And so we should be working with plants that not only can tolerate that, but can potentially thrive with a little bit of care in our gardens at home. And we have so many different choices. So here's just one example of uh, a hike in, up above the foothills into the San Gabriel Mountains. And here is native shrub growing in sheer rock, full blasting west facing sun, middle of summer, this was at the peak of the last drought, and look at how green that is. So it doesn't need to be dry and dusty. And there's hundreds of well-adapted, beautiful, easy to grow plants to choose from. But here's the issue for a lot of people who come to us for our workshops, programs, and help. It used to be really simple, the kind of typical suburban landscapes. You'd have a lawn, maybe you'd have a shade tree, there'd be some sort of amorphous green hedge or some shrubs that oftentimes a, a gardener would just cut back randomly every once in a while with uh, a hedge trimmer and maybe a couple of roses or a few flowers. Wasn't that complicated. So now we're talking about what I think are much more exciting forms of landscape. We have so many more options. There's all these awesome plants, but it's kind of like the wild west. People are wondering, uh, you know, what should we do with all of these choices. And it's kind of overwhelming to go to a nursery and sometimes people get one of this and one of that, and one of this and one of that. And then they come home and they have a jumble that's hard to maintain or figure out what to do with. And so it seems like it's getting complicated. So one of my goals is to help you keep it simple. We are collectively in search for what the new default yard or garden might look like, or maybe a few defaults that we can go to where it's gonna be pretty simple to be successful. A lot of people who I work with, they don't want to be hobbyist gardeners to where every weekend they're out with their pruning shears and learning about plants and, and spending all their time in the garden. If that's you, that's awesome. But if that's not you, that's fine too. And so here's what I propose as our default. Why not lean on easy to grow, low water requiring California native plants? They require in most ways the uh, least amount of water in our gardens. They give the most benefit in terms of additional habitat for butterflies, songbirds, and pollinators, which are awesome to see around as well. And they're gorgeous. And you don't need 172 different species unless you want them all. The average residential yard that I will design for someone has between 12 and 20 species and varieties of plants or species and cultivars of plants total. That includes usually one or two tree choices, some shrub choices, ground covers, and you could have a beautiful yard or garden with you know, five if you want, if, if you really wanna keep it simple. So where do you start? Well, you want to get inspired, look at some examples, and I will share some, some resources with you for that. Consider what you want. Consider what you actually want to maintain. If you don't want to do a lot of maintenance, uh, keep it simple. 
set your goals for your site, research and plan, build it, and then live that outdoor lifestyle California dream. And we are here to help you. So plants are in some ways the most exciting part for many people, but the right plants are only part of that formula for success. So your best bet is to combine what you learned today with our other resources and classes. And so you can check out our upcoming online as well as in-person workshops as we shift mostly to in-person workshops from online workshops during the pandemic. And you can see uh, both options coming up at cbwcd.org slash waterwise workshops. And you can also check out all of our on-demand YouTube workshops at the same link that I put in the chat at the beginning, because you're going to want to combine this with our content on design, on installation and establishment of Waterwise and Native Gardens and all of that. We have that for you. But just to review, how do we select these plants? Well, the primary factors for grouping our plants into the landscape include sun or shade, soil type and drainage. Do you have relatively well draining soil or do you have heavy clay or highly compacted soil that doesn't drain? Either way, even if you have heavy clay, there's lots of things to choose from, but you wanna know that because some water wise plants want good drainage. And irrigation frequency, are these gonna be areas that you're gonna be watering after they're established once a month, twice a month? Uh, do they need water every week? If you have a big higher water use tree that you want to maintain, that's just fine, but you'll need to select uh, plants at least in that area where that tree gets irrigated to be uh, able to tolerate that water because not all water wise or native plants will tolerate that increased water. Some will. Or, you know, are you going to have automatic irrigation system? If so, you can kind of break it up into different zones. Or are you just going to hand water with which with native gardens that after establishment watering once per week, after a year or so, you might only need to water once per month, a good deep soak, then uh, you don't necessarily need an automatic irrigation system at all. And then after that, you can start thinking about aspects of design, like leaf color, texture, structure, form, the visual stuff. And so for that designy part of stuff, we have, like I mentioned, uh, these workshop recordings as well as our Inland Valley Garden Planner website. And pretty soon on our Inland Valley Garden Planner website, I am working on finishing a series of, I think it's gonna end up being 12 videos that really break down the design process, everything from the visual planning that we just mentioned to drawing your site to scale on graph paper if you want to, doing the design, et cetera, et cetera. So be sure to sign up for our newsletter for that announcement, cbwcd.org slash newsletter if you don't get it. And so this is that site that I just mentioned. In some ways, uh, this workshop is a big plug for this site, but I'm going to kind of help you sort through a lot of it and give you kind of some experience and advice that you won't find on the site as well. And so this is our Inland Valley Garden Planner website, and we've done a lot of improvements to it lately, and you have a few different parts of it to explore. The kind of heart of it is our plant finder, which is very intuitive. So you can tell it you know, you're looking for a shrub. Maybe that's California native. It's going to be low water. Maybe the area is partial sun. And so this has our top 360-ish plants for gardens in our area in terms of what you can potentially uh, find in local nurseries relatively easy to grow, has other great qualities. Uh, there's a reason why it was on the list. And a little over a third of them are native plants as well. And so you can, you know, immediately zero in from that larger list that we already kind of helped you uh, pre-select some of our favorite plants down to if you have a, want a native shrub that's low water and partial sun and down to top 20 plants, and then you can start looking through them. Or if you happen to have clay soil, that gives you down to 11 plants. So even if you have that heavy clay soil, in some ways, you still have plenty of options, and that might even make it easier. And then if you select any of these plants, you can get more details. You can see beautiful photography that really gives you an idea of what that plant looks like in different scenarios and closer up, farther back, sometimes younger and older, a full description, 
these plant properties that you need to figure out how to put the right plant in the right place. Watering schedules and people always get confused. Uh, you know, you can do this. It is it if you really get into it, it can be kind of technical. Uh, but then we have more information that uh, mentions it. But for the vast majority of the plants, we're going to talk about uh, a good deep soak once a week in the first year or so, and then as it seems like it's established, uh, tapering down to uh, once per month is going to be about right for most of Southern California. And with some of the exceptions, I'll mention that as we go. And then for all these plants, you're gonna to wanna to know how to maintain it afterwards, after it gets going. And so maintenance is easy for most of them. Most of them only need to be touched once, maybe twice a year for optimal maintenance, some of them even less than that, but you need to know what to do and when, so we have that information. If you want some help on how to put these plants together or also really help narrow it down to just some kind of coordinated palettes of plants to help you get going right away, you can check out our design templates. And so he, here we have kind of eight concepts that have become, we found like the most popular things that people are interested in in our area. The butterfly and songbird garden is probably the most popular, so I most often show that off, but can, why don't we look at the meadow garden quickly today. Explore that design. And so for each of these, there's a description, and you can see visualizations of how these simple plant palettes, most of these plant palettes are, we keep it to like 12 or 13 different kinds of plants. Uh, the meadow garden, we actually were missing the, the small tree that we have, uh, but we kept it really simple because it's mostly different grasses and a few perennial plants for color, uh, but most of them have trees, shrubs, et cetera. And you can get some ideas of what things would look like then with names and different visualizations that also have pop-ups where you can go directly to the plant profiles if you are interested. And then these, if you like the look, all match exactly to these plan view plans. And literally you could print this out and use a ruler and an eighth of an inch equals one foot if you print it out on an 11 by 17 sheet of paper. And you can use these plant combinations to adapt to your space. And we have examples of the same palette for extra large, large, medium, and smaller landscapes, plus additional information. And you can download a convenient uh, PDF file packet that has all of this package together in one file if you are interested. There's also lists to help you with individual kind of situations. So if you just want to look at plants that are great for slopes, you can also search by a lot of these criteria. or you need a hedge or a screening plant or uh, favorite plants for dry stream bed situations down in the dry stream bed or right next to it. You have all of that sort of information. And then finally, there's an additional resources page that we just launched that gets you uh, other stuff. On-demand workshops, this all kind of links to our YouTube page, uh, our upcoming workshops that you can sign up for, additional details for installation and planting, like planting these plants properly, uh, information if you're planting a dry stream bed or other water infiltration features, uh, best how to figure out the best kind of mulch for you, all that sort of stuff. And then in our local area where you can buy plants of different types, uh, other landscape materials as well, information for hiring a contractor. And then of course, if you wanna come visit our garden, we hope you come join us. So that is essentially the Inland Valley Garden Planner website. Every plant that we show today will have a detailed profile so that you can learn more on here and learn how to maintain it if you do select the plant for your garden. You can also create your own login. And when you do that, you can create multiple lists of plants. If you have different ideas for your projects or different sites that you're thinking about or different projects, you can save your lists as you go and refer back to those lists later on when you come back to the site. And so with that, let's get back into the main workshop. And so I don't see any other questions coming in yet, but remember you can always type your questions into the Q and A. And so now we're gonna transition, we've gotten through the intro part, we're gonna transition to just going through to that these 
plants that are one suggestion for the new basic plant palette. You may very well want to bring in other plants, uh, which is great. Uh, there are other plants that I could have had in here. I just needed to narrow them down enough to be able to put together content for one workshop. But you can very well put together a great garden in most areas of Southern California just by relying on these favorite plants. And so here is my suggestion for kind of the default basic new plant palette for our Southern California home landscapes. We'll start with the largest and longest lived plants. Trees are hopefully the largest and longest lived plants in the yard. They'll create shade over time and so they'll have the largest impact of any plant in the garden. They also happen to have the largest impact uh, ecologically in many cases because they provide structural homes for birds and other critters and create different microclimates in the garden. So we're going to start with small trees because a lot of people who I work with don't have room for a big giant tree in your yard. If you do have room for a big giant tree to grow in, in your yard, in a lot of cases, I'd say go ahead and plant that. But we're going to start with some of my favorite small trees. And one of my go-tos is the desert willow. This is a California native plant to the true desert out into Arizona. So I've seen this thing growing uh, outside of Las Vegas on the side of the highway, just full blasting desert sun. Uh, and they tend to grow on the side of the highways because the rain runoff just creates a slightly wetter area there. But these things are really tough, full blasting sun. Uh, they're very happy next to, not down in, but next to the dry stream beds. They don't need a lot of water, but they can really thrive on that extra water that maybe is in a functional dry stream bed if you have a dry stream bed that takes some of the water off of your roof or something like that. They have a long bloom season, spring to summer. We have a desert willow at the edge of our parking lot at our demonstration and headquarters facility. Full, full blasting afternoon sun, reflected heat from asphalt on one side and concrete on the other. And when we've had some of those like 113 degree day heat waves in the past where even our native and water wise plants look kind of miserable, this is one of those plants that just is in its element. It's just pushing out more flowers, uh, just turning that heat into beautiful, beautiful orchid like flowers. Uh, some of our California native desert plants, which aren't necessarily truly native to our local area, really thrive in those hot microclimates in our urban areas. That urban heat island effect, that pavement reflected heat, our, our desert plants just thrive in that. And one of the cool things is that a lot of our local native plants uh, with their Mediterranean climate adaptations to those hot dry summers are really concentrating their bloom seasons either in the spring to early summer or in the late summer into fall and midsummer there are some plants that will be in bloom but midsummer tends to be a little quieter for flowers of our local native plants but a lot of the desert plants that come from a little bit farther east are really going to be in their bloom and kind of prime through a lot of the summer so they also help extend our season of flower color in our garden and with that that also extends the season of providing nectar for hummingbirds and pollen for pollinators and nectar for butterflies and things like that as well. And this tree is loved by hummingbirds and pollinators. It is deciduous, so it loses its leaves in the winter. And so sometimes uh, that's great. So these are great to use in places where you want you know, protection from the sun in the summer, but maybe uh, are open to having a little bit more sun penetration in the winter. And so that's desert willow. Uh, another one of my favorite small trees is the Desert Museum Palo Verde. This is another tree that is a desert California native into other parts of the Southwest. And this one is actually a hybrid that was uh, named after uh, the Desert Botanical Garden. I think, or actually maybe it's the Living Desert, one of the botanical gardens, I can't remember right now. Uh, and so this is not a wild plant, but it is a naturally uh, created hybrid through cross-pollinization that combines the best qualities of some of the wild Palo Verde trees. It's thornless, it blooms a lot, and it's a very fast grower. And it can also take that full blasting sun, is happy next to, but not down in dry stream beds. 
uh, flowers much of the warm season. It is absolutely loved by pollinators. Uh, hummingbirds like it too, uh, but especially uh, some of the larger bees, the bumblebees and carpenter bees, which don't sting and are great pollinators. They just love these flowers. And it, it does drop a lot of the spent flower petals, but it's kind of actually lovely on pavement. Eventually you might want to clean it up, but it's like this uh, yellow kind of dusting, kind of snowy effect. Uh, absolutely beautiful. Uh, one of my favorite trees. And so that's Desert Museum. Palo Verde. Uh, they do tend to be a little floppy when they're young. You need to stake them usually for the first uh, at least year or so. And if you check out the planting details on that Inland Valley Garden Planner page, uh, we show proper staking as well as the installation and establishment for California Native Garden class. We talk about proper staking. A lot of people when they stake trees, they don't do it correctly in a way that really allows them to start to develop their own strength so that the stakes can be removed before long. And so you definitely wanna make sure that you're doing that correctly if you do. And then this is one of my other favorites. This is actually uh, not the best picture, but it shows kind of the size that Toyon can get. This is Toyon. This is a local native plant. It, it's really a large shrub, but over time with pruning, it can be pruned up to be a quite lovely multi-trunk small tree. And this grows wild in our pretty much all local areas in Southern California from the San Gabriel Mountains uh, out to coastal kind of mountains as well. It can take full blasting sun. This thing is so tough. Uh, once you learn kind of what this looks like and start to notice the clusters of red berries that occur in the fall to winter, you will start noticing this in random spots along the freeways in Southern California. Caltrans plants it sometimes because it is so tough. And if it can survive in that compact, terrible freeway embankment soil, it can survive in your yard in most cases. Uh, they don't need much water at all. They grow wild in our local area and they can transition to uh, not getting any water at all, but they can also take a little bit of water. So they're pretty decent for a wet to dry transition zone for maybe adjacent to an area that gets regular water, but not right in it as it transitions to your drier water wise or native garden. Uh, they're also pretty shade tolerant, full blasting sun down to, you know, significant shade, like at the edge of an oak tree canopy or something like that. And you can also plant them closer together and turn them into a shrub or keep them uh, as a shrub as well. They take pruning, so you can kind of control the size. Butterflies and pollinators use the flowers and birds absolutely love the fall to winter berries. There's not a lot of other berries for the birds that like fresh fruit. Uh, in the fall to winter season. So they're a really important food source during that time of the year. And they're lovely. Uh, they, the berries do drop, but it's kind of a dryish berry. So it's not like uh, if you had a mulberry tree or a peach tree over pavement or something like that. There is a little bit of cleanup on the pavement, but it doesn't create like an instant trip hazard or anything like that. Uh, so this is one uh, of the plants I'm growing as a small tree in my front yard. Uh, and uh, it's absolutely lovely. So you can see the flower buds. It's, it's an evergreen uh, plant, so different than the other two. Most of the small trees that you would grow around here that are my favorites happen to be deciduous or lose their leaves. This one is truly evergreen, and it has its, its drought adaptation is that thick leathery leaf. So it's this nice, even green uh, all year round, big clusters of berries, I mean, of flowers, you know, five, four or five inches across, uh, absolutely lovely. And then those big clusters of red berries. This is truly a native plant, even for people who don't necessarily think they look like the look of native plants. Really, really one of my favorites. This one's a little bit funkier. It's a really, really cool plant. Uh, this is our native elderberry, sometimes called blue elderberry, sometimes called Mexican elderberry. Uh, it is a local native plant, also grows native uh, down into Mexico. And it is an incredibly important wildlife habitat plant. It is beautiful this time of the year uh, in leaf, huge flower clusters, even bigger than the toyons. These things are like uh, saucers or small plates uh, of, of flower cluster. And 
they can, they grow in all sorts of situations. They like a little bit of water. They're great in a wet to dry transition zone. Uh, they're great on uh, gray water. If you happen to have a gray water system or an area, you know, even kind of where the roots might, you wouldn't want to plant it in a lawn, but might be kind of at the edge of a lawn and transitioning into a drier area. Uh, depending on how much water it gets, it might go deciduous in the summer. It's called drought deciduous because it could lose its leaves. It also does go deciduous in the winter. Uh, and so you kind of would think about where you place it depending on that. Uh, even with some supplemental irrigation, that some that we have in our park at the Waterwise Community Center do go somewhat deciduous in the summer. Uh, but the one that I have five minute drive away at my home in Pomona, which is on the east side of my house, so kind of full morning sun, but then get some shade in the afternoon, uh, does not go summer deciduous. So it also really depends on the site. Uh, spring flowers are loved by butterflies and pollinators, and then the berries are important bird food. And this one has been pruned pretty closely. This thing is, in terms of the form, it is a kind of hot mess of a tree. It kind of grows, uh, suckers a lot, kind of grows all over the place. Takes some pruning to really kind of keep it like this. It gets easier as it gets a little bit older and the branches start to become more woody. Uh, so this is not a default plant for everyone, but definitely still makes it on my top plant list, especially if you have uh, a really habitat focused garden or you have, uh, you know, like a lower corner of your backyard where you can have something that is a little bit wild and kind of more funky looking. Overall, I do feel like it is underplanted and it is absolutely lovely. Uh, this is one that I can see from the window in my bedroom at my house and I love having it uh, kind of close by. A lot goes on in this tree in terms of the wildlife benefits. And so those are my favorite small trees. And we're gonna move on to uh, large trees. Just a few recommendations for large trees. Uh, if you have room for one large tree in most of Southern California, it should probably be a coast live oak. This is the most widespread oak in most of Southern California. They will get to be 35 to 40 feet wide over time, over a long time, uh, potentially even wider, but if you're planting one from a reasonable size, you might not be likely to be around for it getting over 40 feet wide. It can take full blasting sun. Uh, it is such an important habitat plant that it's considered an ecological hub species. California's two main ecological hubs are oak trees, uh, the whole group of oak trees, not just coast live oak, but coast live oak very much fits into that, but it's oak trees and willows. And willows are riparian plants. They mostly grow in or at the edge of water. So they need quite a bit of water and they kind of spread by the roots and grow all over the place for most species. So most people aren't going to be growing willows at home, but oaks, if you can uh, plant an oak, they are so important because they support so many levels of wildlife. Birds love to hang out in them just as a shelter. I have one coast life oak in my backyard it's not even a fully mature one, but it's it's been growing pretty well. It's maybe 30 feet tall now, uh, definitely less than 30 feet wide. And on an average morning in my yard, there will there's always birds in it, but not uncommon for there to be you know, five to six different species of birds in it at a time, darting out into the yard and then going back into the oak tree. Some birds will eat the acorns that the tree produces. But one of the most important aspects of it is that you will generally never see it happening, but the coast live oak is a larval host plant to tons of butterfly and moth species. And so that means that the caterpillars have evolved with them and will eat the leaves as a food source. Could be up to 122 species in California. And so you get to have butterflies in your yard, but even potentially more important than that is that most species of birds require caterpillars as the nutrition source uh, to basically have that real nutrition density, high protein packet of food that is a caterpillar uh, in order for those baby birds to mature. Even a lot of the species of birds that maybe mostly eat seeds when they're older still rely on caterpillars for the young. And so if you have that in your yard, you have the caterpillars and then you have the baby, boot, the baby bird food source. It's also a beautiful tree. 
And there is absolutely nothing like being in the shade of an oak on a warm day. My oak, which has been growing surprisingly quickly in my yard, uh, is still not a mature oak tree, but just over the last really like year, it's gotten to the size where even if it's one of these really hot inland days that we have been experiencing this week, in the afternoon, the shade underneath it is absolutely amazing. And so underneath it is mulch and oak leaves and a few plants and just plop a chair down there. And it's just outdoor air conditioning and a lovely place to uh, watch the rest of the yard or just sit and hang out, even when it's really hot out in the rest of the yard. And so here is a quite mature one as a street tree. And uh, yeah, oaks, if you have room for one, plant one. Another really useful larger tree, which has a very different kind of growth pattern is the Catalina Island cherry or Catalina cherry. This is a cousin to actually a local uh, native cherry species. They are true cherries like with the pit and the red fruit, but they don't taste like the cultivated cherries. Technically, if they're fully ripe, they are edible, but they're mostly a big seed and just a little bit of kind of dryish flesh around them by the time that they are ripe. And you would never want to eat the unripe ones. They contain uh, some toxins in them. But Catalina Island cherry is a lovely tree. And one of the useful things about it is that it grows tall relatively quickly, but it's not very wide. And so it will quickly grow to uh, 25 feet, maybe a little bit taller than that. But generally in gardens is only 10 to 15 feet, maybe a little bit wider. And so if uh, you have like along the edge of your property a need for some screening, this is one of the best water-wise plants to use. I have a, a row of three of them where I needed some screening in my backyard. Planted them from little, little one gallon plants and they're not screening yet, but in the course of about three years, they're probably at least 12 feet tall now. And so now I'm kind of waiting for them to thicken up some and start to provide that screening. But still, that's pretty good for a low water plant in not many years. Uh, they have beautiful spring flowers that are absolutely loved by many pollinators and butterflies. Birds love the fruit that follows, especially the medium-sized songbirds like mockingbirds and jays, and some of the smaller uh, some of the smaller birds will eat the fruit as well. And they are that larval host plant for many beautiful butterfly species, including swallowtails, admirals, and hair streaks. And the cherries themselves are quite an attractive ornamentation as well. This is one of the few non-native plants that are is in the presentation but it is a lovely evergreen option. Uh, all of these in the larger tree categories so far are evergreen. Uh, this is the Marina strawberry tree, Arbutus Marina. It's a slow growing large tree from the Mediterranean. It does have beautiful winter flowers that are utilized by hummingbirds and butterflies. And so since there's not as many plants in the midwinter, and this one is a, a tough water-wise plant, that's one of the reasons why, even though it's not native, it shows up on my favorite plant list. They, the flowers, for those of you who know native plants, are very similar to uh, manzanita flowers. And it's actually kind of a, a distant cousin of manzanita, uh, also of madrone, which is a, a tree native to farther north in California, which is tough to grow down here. Uh, but this is a lovely tree that has those habitat functions and is uh, absolutely lovely. It, you can buy it in nurseries as a single trunk or a multi-trunk tree, but really it looks best as a multi-trunk tree. Those are always, in my opinion, the most lovely ones. And it does have these fruits. They are technically edible, but they really do not taste like much, but there will be some amount of fruit drop. And so anticipate that if you're kind of growing it over pavement somewhere. And those are the large tree recommendations for kind of keeping it simple. There are definitely other ones you can grow, but those are my go-tos. Uh, I still don't see any questions coming in. Oh, from Jeannie. Uh, so Jeannie, can you please type your question into the Q&A and then I will answer it just as soon as it comes in. So please click the Q&A. Uh, little button in your Zoom interface and type your question in. 
And then we will just keep on going. I'm gonna grab a sip of water. And let's continue on to our, our large shrubs and our accent plants. So going into large shrubs, you will find toyon again. So we talked about how it could be pruned up as a tree. There's really not inherently a difference between a shrub and a tree. That's just sort of a, a call that people make. Uh, and the size of the in-between could kind of go either way. And so this is showing toyon grown more as a shrub. Eventually it will get bigger, but like I mentioned, it can take pruning, uh, but works very well as a shrub or a screen in between, in this case, in between properties. Uh, great along property lines. So for example, I mentioned that I have that row of the Catalina Island cherries directly next to that row of the Catalina Island cherries in my yard as I'm ready for that uh, perimeter planting to uh, still be higher than the fence, but kind of start to not be quite as high as the Catalina Island cherries. I have a toy on right next to it uh, as kind of that sh screening shrub. I also have a toy on my front yard that I'm pruning up to be more of that accent tree. And so I'm not going to talk about Toyon again because we already went through it. Another one of my favorites, which really could be considered a tree as well, again, large shrubs, small tree, whatever you want to call it, is the Western red bud. This is a local native plant as well, it tends to grow at kind of the medium elevations near here up in the mountains, but does very well, especially with just a little bit of supplemental water. Uh, down in the Inland Valley areas. We'll do find uh, in the more kind of LA, Orange County areas out towards the coast. It's a deciduous shrub, a small multi-trunk tree. I have begin, begun to see the Western red bud more and more uh, offered in nurseries, already trained as a single trunk tree. It does not do very well long-term as a single trunk tree. It really wants to be a multi-trunk uh, tree or large shrub. Usually after the stakes come off within the first couple of years, that single trunk uh, really starts leaning a lot and it just does not stay as vigorous long-term as a single trunk tree. Uh, I would not recommend it even though it might look nice in the nursery pot. It has beautiful spring flowers, absolutely gorgeous. The leaves, which you will see uh, in the next slide, are lovely kind of thin heart-shaped leaves. And pollinators love the spring blooms. Uh, it's a somewhat early spring bloomer. And a lot of the larger pollinators that, that emerge early as well, the carpenter bees and the bumblebees really like it. Uh, leaf cutter bees, which are a native bee that actually chews up kind of edges of leaves in these semicircular patterns that are quite ornamental. Love these leaves because they're relatively thin. And then they kind of use that pulp to build their nests. The seed pods then mature into bird food. These are, they become bird feeders. And these can also be happy in kind of a wet to dry transition zone, or it can be drier, or it can even take a little bit more regular water. And so you can see here the leaves that are starting to come out and the new growth has this kind of coppery color to it, both the leaves themselves, as well as the very edges of the leaves that they emerge. They're absolutely lovely. And then you can see how it starts to darken and get just a little bit leathery uh, for the older growth. And then here are the seed pods that are starting to develop and they dry on the tree and then birds will come around to eat the seeds. And I really prefer to grow my own bird food. Uh, the seed-based feeders that, that people will put out in their yards, uh, those are often where disease becomes transmitted between different birds and different species of birds because there's just such a concentration into the exact same spot over and over and over again. And so if you do have those feeders, clean them very regularly. Most people with those feeders do not clean them nearly often enough, uh, but I prefer just to have lots of different plants that create seeds that birds like, and then there's much less of a concentration in one exact place. So a tree, large shrub, that's beautiful, ornamental, good for pollinators and good for feeding the birds. And now we're kind of stepping down from like the larger, 
sized uh, accent shrubs down to more kind of medium shrubs. Uh, this is a true desert shrub with just one of the most unique looking, uh, fl not flowers, but post flower kind of uh, seed package, you could say, keep it simple. Uh, so this is Apache plume, Fulugia paradoxa. This is another true desert native that can take beautiful full blasting sun. It kind of is an amorphous form with tiny leaves of the plant itself. But look at this, and this is actually, the flowers are small white flowers. So these are seed plumes uh, that are part of the seed distribution of how the, the life cycle of the plant works. And this just captures the light. And because these are not the flowers themselves, this will stay on the plant for months after the flowers fade. Absolutely lovely. And these are in no particular order. Uh, just kind of all the, some of my favorite plants that I love. Uh, manzanitas are absolutely, absolutely beautiful, habitat rich garden plants for Southern California. There are many, many, many species of manzanitas that grow in California. And if you look at what's available at the nurseries that sell California native plants, there are going to be many species as well as many what are called cultivars of manzanitas. And a cultivar is a plant that was selected. Uh, sometimes it's a hybrid. Sometimes it's just selected from the wild for a specific characteristic. And so if you see the, uh, if you look at the scientific name and then you see in these, not quotes, but you see kind of uh, the, the uh, name like this, often named after a person, then that is a cultivar. And so manzanitas are lovely plants, but some of them are tricky to grow. And if you are a gardening enthusiast and you want to try different things, try whatever manzanitas you want. But in terms of my top plants that are easy to grow, I keep my manzanita recommendations for kind of casual gardeners uh, pretty limited because I want people to be as successful as possible. And so one of my top manzanitas, it's the most common one because it's one of the easiest to grow, is called Howard McMinn manzanita. And it has winter flowers that hummingbirds and if there are butterflies around at the time, really, really appreciate because there are not as many flowers in the winter. Some of them are late winter to early spring. A uh, few of the species go other times. Uh, those develop into small red berries that are loved by birds. The manzanitas tend to have a beautiful red bark. Some species are shaggy, some species are smoother. And many of them, including Howard McMinn manzanita, work in full to part sun, or yeah, full, or sorry, full sun to part shade. Uh, if you are growing manzanita inland in a home garden situation, your best chance for success with manzanitas is going to be growing them somewhere where they get morning sun, but by the afternoon, they are going to be shaded. It's less important in the coastal areas, but I really like to grow them on the east side of a house or uh, in an area where they'll get uh, full sun in the morning and then shade in the afternoon by a tree or a fence or something like that, especially even if the leaves aren't gonna get shade, the soil uh, to be shaded, because that is something that the manzanitas are sensitive to is, uh, if you do your supplemental watering in the summer, the wet, hot soil is something that is sometimes problematic for them. And so that being said, uh, Howard McMinn Manzanita and the others that I most often recommend are the most tolerant to those situations. And so it's, it's not an absolute rule. The Manzanita that I have in my backyard is in pretty full sun. There's some smaller plants around it now that as it grows in are shading parts of its root zone. Uh, but that's gonna be the easiest way to grow manzanitas for most people in kind of a hot inland environment. And it's just a lovely plant. This is one of the larger Howard McMinn manzanitas I have seen. Picture from the Inland Valley Garden Planner. Uh, the leaves are lovely. They're kind of more on that leathery side plant adaptation. So they, they tend to look pretty 
solid year round. They don't kind of shrivel up or go dormant or anything like that. And yeah, great plants overall. Uh, tend to be sort of, uh, if you do get them established visually, kind of anchoring plants in the landscape. Okay, so from a few questions have come in. So from Laura, do any of these plants not do well with summer water? Uh, for the most part, any of these trees are going to be okay with that infrequent deep soak. So that deep soak once a week the first year or year and a half for establishment and then tapering down to uh, once a month-ish in most situations in Southern California is generally going to be fine for all of them. Uh, truly mature oak trees, uh, generally you'll want to uh, really not give them any summer water over time. And like what you would do with the mature oak tree is if we have a very dry winter, like the one we just had, then coming out of the winter in the springtime on some of the cooler weeks, you're going to want to give it some extra deep soaks to kind of recharge the, the, the soil with some moisture deep down in the spring, but then let it stay dry over the summer at least at the edge and underneath the canopy, they are more tolerant of, you know, if you have garden outside the canopy, that getting some water once or twice a month, you know, that's normally fine. Uh, but most of these trees are going to be fine with that, but you wouldn't want to like plop them in a lawn for any of these trees. Uh, okay. So question from Noel. Are there any small fruit trees you would recommend for this area, even if they are not water wise? Thanks. Yes, lots of them. I love growing fruit trees. Uh, we have a whole online workshop called, it's about fruit trees. I think it's like, mm, I taught the workshop. I blank it on the name now, but it's you know, fruit trees for Southern California home gardens, I think. So you get all my top recommendations there, but uh, figs, pomegranates, citrus, persimmons, are going to be some of your easiest ones. And all of those with pruning, you can keep relatively small. If you need very small, uh, some of the dwarf citrus, like dwarf kumquats and Meyer lemons and things might be the way to go. Uh, do Apache plumes reseed and become invasive? Uh, I have never had them become invasive. We get a little bit of light reseeding here at the Waterwise Community Center, uh, but I mean, just, after having, I've been here for five years and I think I've seen two or three seedlings come up, which were very easy to pull out. And one of them we left because it came up in a space that would be lovely to have another one. Uh, some of that's very site specific. It's also specific to what you have covering the soil, but I've never heard of that being one with a reputation in Southern California for it, uh, being one that that is uh, problematic with receding. Some great questions. Keep them coming in, everybody. Also, as we keep going, uh, we will take a five minute break about halfway through the workshop for people who need to refresh their coffee, use the restroom, something like that. But for now, we're going to keep on going. And so next plant, Baja Fairy Duster. This is another one that is more of a desert-ish plant, and this is not from California proper, although it is from uh, Baja area, which is considered botanically part of the California floristic province is what it's called. So uh, most people would still consider it a California native plant because we are talking about the California floristic province, not necessarily the, the uh, you know, political boundary line at the southern edge of California. And this is an awesome plant for gardens, especially in inland heat. It is one of those ones that translates the summer heat to more and more flowers. It's fond of that full blasting sun. Flowers almost year round in inland gardens and is absolutely, absolutely adored by hummingbirds. Pollinators love it as well. Almost year round color from this plant. They're not always this wide. This is a really lovely one, but they can take pruning. So you can kind of, prune them however you need to. Oftentimes, especially when they're younger, they're a little bit, uh, they're taller and narrower and very easy to grow. Couple of things, uh, because it's from Baja to note about it. 
their first year when they're young, they can be a little bit frost sensitive. And uh, so because of that, this is one of the few California native plants that I have actually been more successful planting in the spring in terms of getting it off to a good start, uh, planting early spring than planting in the fall or winter. That being said, I do plant it in the fall or winter, but sometimes it just kind of looks miserable until it really starts to uh, kind of get its, its spring growth on. So uh, Baja Fairy Duster, absolutely lovely. Look at that up close, just, just gorgeous. And very different kind of shrub. The last one was that real colorful showstopper. This one, uh, less, but there are reasons why it's one of my favorite plants. This is coyote brush. It is a fast growing green shrub with very small flowers. Uh, the flowers are so small that you almost might not even notice them, but then after they kind of dry out, the, the dried flowers do have a kind of snowy fluff that is quite ornamental, but it is a really important flower for pollinators and other beneficial insects, and it comes in the late summer and fall, and so uh, that's a really important time to kind of spread out that flowering season in our gardens. Uh, the birds will come and eat the seed, but almost or even more important than that is that it's a, the internal structure of the coyote brush is pretty dense and stemmy and they become very good shrubs for bird nesting. They're really, really good for habitat, both for the beneficial insects and the birds. Uh, there's a variety of different forms from the ones that you can get at the nursery. The typical coyote brush will be about eight to 10 feet tall and eight to 10 feet wide, although it can take any sort of pruning that you want. It could even take uh, you know, size control with a hedge trimmer. Although if you are going to be pruning it because it's so popular for bird nesting, uh, you don't want to prune it during nesting season. And so nesting season is a lot of the year in Southern California, but October through early winter is uh, really the, the time where the birds are going to be least likely to uh, be nesting. It's considered safe out of nesting season. So if you do print it for size control, uh, best to do it in the fall or early winter to make sure that you are not disturbing any bird nests. And so that's the typical one. Uh, great for a hedge at the edge of a property or something like that. Uh, as they grow older, they're not the luscious looking plants. And in fact, every five, 10 years, if you want to, they actually do benefit from being cut right down to the ground and then they just re-sprout from the roots very quickly. If you ever need to clean up the look, you can do that. You might never need to, or might never want to, and that's fine too. But there are also selections of it that are more ground cover versions. So the most popular choice of the ground cover selection is called Pigeon Point. And that, if it's spaced appropriately, will grow to be about knee to thigh high with some pruning, you can keep it lower. And eight-ish feet wide, maybe a little bit wider. And so sometimes people will do very simple front yards with native plants and they'll have a whole section of the front yard that's just this as that kind of medium-sized ground cover. Very simple way to cover some ground with very low maintenance native plants in a front yard. And then they'll mix it with a couple of sages or buckwheats for some more kind of flower color and interest. And we'll be looking at sages and buckwheats shortly. Another larger sized shrub that is one of my favorites is holly leaf cherry. This is our local California native cherry. It has a lot of similarities to the Catalina Island cherry that I mentioned earlier, but this one tends to stay quite a bit smaller. Uh, if you read about it online, you will see that, you know, sources will say that this could be from six to 30 feet tall. And that's from, uh, the variety of habitats it's found in the wild. And it's very rare. I've never seen a 30 foot tall one in the wild, but there are cases in the exact right microclimates where that happens. It, that won't be the case in the garden. In the garden, it's likely to be eight to 10 ish feet tall, uh, maybe eight feet wide, can take pruning and doesn't grow super quickly. So you can shape it however you need to. It's an elegant looking shrub year round. It has a beautiful evergreen leaf. And just like its Catalina cousin, uh, great for pollinators, birds, and larval host plant for many species of butterflies. Uh, great hedge plant. And I often will do hedges, including in my front yard, uh, I have a hedge that separates my front yard from my neighbor's driveway, and it's a combination of this plant and 
California coffee berry, which is one of my other favorite hedge plants. And if you want a third plant, uh, you can mix in some of that coyote brush and all of those are, are great. I, I often promote what I call habitat hedges, which are mixed evergreen hedges of native plants that are great for habitat. And those are my three favorites. And so California coffee berry is very widespread plant. It is a local native plant and I've seen it in foothill areas and you know, summer, middle of a drought, full blasting sun. And it still has this nice evergreen look. It grows in full sun to pretty much full shade. It'll grow faster in the sun, but really flexible. And so if you have a hedge that's transitioning from sunnier to shadier to sunnier areas, this is a really good one to consider. It looks great year round, nice evergreen leaves. They have tiny spring to maybe early summer flowers that are adored by pollinators. Uh, you don't really see the details of flowers from far away because of how small they are, but they're lovely up close. Birds absolutely love the fruit that follows, really important fruit for medium-sized songbirds like mockingbirds and jays, but they're also enjoyed by uh, smaller birds like some of the sparrows that will actually sit and peck at this uh, medium-sized round fruit and it's almost like they're hitting a punching bag, kind of funny to watch. Uh, but yeah, the fruit is really important, bird food. Uh, larval host plant, too many species of butterflies. And there's also some great dwarf selection. So if you happen to be in the inland heat, one of our best performers for the dwarf selection is called Eve Case. That'll be a knee to thigh high version that will get uh, six-ish feet wide over time if you let it. But again, it can also take pruning. Just the normal species will be uh, eight to 10-ish feet uh, tall and wide, but again, easy to prune. So here you can see the flowers and the new growth, which is a little bit lighter, and then it darkens up as the leaves age. And then they mature to, the reason why it's called coffee berry is because they form berries that are green and then they turn bright red, and then they mature to a coffee color. Uh, Great for birds, uh, not related to coffee at all. It's just the color of the berries. Uh, we can't eat them. Some people report that they do, but they also have a reputation for being mildly toxic. I've, I've tried to really do the research on it. I, I can't really find anything definitive. You know, they're not going to kill you or send you directly to the hospital if you eat a few. And I've never heard of any issues with kids or dogs or anything like that eating them and getting sick. Uh, but because it does have that reputation for mildly being uh, not good for you. I do like to mention it, but then there'll be people on native plant forums that are like, I make juice out of it and it's delicious and I'm always fine. So uh, yeah, go figure. Uh, but lovely plant, one of my favorites overall. And then transitioning into one of my favorites for a large-ish shrub for a shady space, uh, Part shade to significant shade, great for that north exposure, north side of the house, is Golden Abundance Oregon grape. It's a hybrid of a couple of native grape species, which makes a beautiful, beautiful, uh, vibrant shrub. Gets pretty large, uh, six to eight feet, six to eight feet-ish. Uh, the leaves do have small kind of thorns, kind of like a holly towards the edge that are that are kind of scratchy. It uh, looks lovely here. Personally, I wouldn't put it this close to a footpath that I need to use, but maybe this is really like a secondary path that they don't, don't use that much. Uh, pollinators love the spring flowers, and the flowers come pretty early in the spring, so it's, it's kind of a, a really nice kind of early treat for the pollinators. Uh, they're followed up by dark blue berries, which the birds eat and the glossy green leaves look very attractive year round. So it provides lots of color throughout the year from the, from the, uh, from the yellow of the flowers to the blue and then the leaves and yeah, absolutely lovely kind of plant. And so with that, we are about halfway through our time together. And so why don't we use this as a break to break for about five minutes and then 
we will come back and we'll talk about the medium and smaller size shrubs and then we'll get into smaller kind of ground covers perennial plants and things like that so it's getting close to 1028 now so we'll pick back up at 1033 we'll start with any questions that we have and then go on from there
All right, we are back, everybody. We'll start with some questions that came in from Laura. Will Baja Fairy Duster take some shade? Uh, I've never grown it in the shade. I don't think it's pretty tough. So it might grow, but you probably won't get good flowering and it probably won't look that good if it's in true part shade. But it it should be able to take like morning sun with some afternoon shade in most of Southern California. And we get into this uh, a little bit more in some of our other classes. Uh, full sun doesn't need to be sun all day, sun up to sundown. So even full sun plants are normally going to be perfectly happy with at least six hours of direct sunlight throughout most of the day. So for example, if it's on the east side of a house where it gets morning sun, midday, and then kind of afternoon shade, or on the west side of the house where it's shaded in the morning and then gets sun midday through the afternoon, that generally can be considered, as long as there's no other obstructions, to be a full sun kind of scenario. So hopefully that will help. And some questions. Uh, once again, I'll remind people, please put your questions into the Q&A function. Type them into the Q&A. That's the best way I can receive and see questions. But I did happen to see that Jeannie uh, put some questions into the chat. So I will answer those right now. Uh, the name of the dwarf coffee berry. So the dwarf coffee berry that I most often use is called Eve Case. I'll type that into the chat, E-V-E-C-A-S-E. -E for the coffee berry. Uh, there are a few different ones, but if you happen to be in kind of the inland warm areas, uh, Inland Empire, any of the valleys, and are growing in full sun, in my experience, Eve Case is the one that does the best. Some of the other ones uh, thrive a little bit more coastally, and if they're in full sun in the hot, hot summer heat, they, they might not thrive quite as much, but Eve Case is my go-to for the dwarf ones. And then discussing watering regimen for the Coast Live Oak, uh, you know, kind of early through establishment. Uh, I would, you know, the real answer is it depends, but a good kind of starting point would be first year, uh, good deep soak once per week, Second year, as long as it seems like things are growing really well, that could probably be once per week or tapering down to every three to four weeks. By the third year, uh, you know, probably once a month or maybe already tapering it down to letting it go dry in the summer and then just uh, making sure that if it doesn't rain during the cooler months that you give it a good deep soak at least once a month. And certainly by year four or five, you would want to be down to leaving it dry in the summer if possible and just making sure that in the spring and the fall after it cools as well as through the winter months, if it doesn't get rain, it gets a good deep soak. And then eventually, uh, you know, once it, it really is putting on some size, it would basically just be some spring watering or late winter watering uh, if we don't get the rains. General kind of guidelines. Uh, from Anne, where can you buy the plants? So there are going to be uh, local nurseries. There are going to be a slide at, or there's going to be a slide at the towards the end that has a list but also uh, I don't know if you're with us earlier but on our Inland Valley Garden Planner website which is inlandvalleygardenplanner.org if you go to the resources section there is a tab where you can find the main local nurseries for general Los Angeles area that I know about to get these kinds of plants if you're from a farther flung area uh, couple of options for you. One, you there's also a really, really great uh, native plant website. That's a project of the California Native Plant Society it's called Calscape. I'm typing in the link to the chat, calscape.org. Uh, I mentioned that in some of our other workshops. We don't really have time to cover it today, but you can find lots of information on there about nurseries that carry native plants all throughout much of California. And then if you are, I always like to go to local nurseries to support our local nurseries. 
as well as to see the plants before I buy them. However, if you uh, are not able to find stuff at your local nurseries, there is also a uh, online kind of ordering platform where you can order your plants online for your project and they'll drop them all off for you uh, at once. And that's called Plants Express. And you can find that online as well. And they often have a good variety of these plants and purchase from some of the same wholesale nurseries that uh, a lot of the retail nurseries purchase from as well. So with that, let's jump into it and continue to put your questions into the Q&A as they come up for you. Uh, and so let's start to get down a little bit to the smaller scale with the medium and smaller size shrubs. And kind of structurally what you're doing in the garden by the time you get down to these smaller size shrubs is you're kind of starting to uh, build some depth into your landscape. And the size of the average kind of residential landscape might be something similar to this. It might not be this narrow, but I think this is a, a nice example of working with medium-sized shrubs, even in a constrained space. So this is a front yard in uh, Van Nuys, Southern California that I saw as I was going on the Theodore Payne Foundation Native Plant Garden Tour one year. Uh, just a quick plug for another organization that does lots of incredible education. Uh, Theodore Payne Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to the conservation and promotion of California native plants. They're located in Sun Valley and the San Fernando Valley, uh, but they're active throughout much of Southern California. And every spring they have an incredible garden tour that's all over Los Angeles area into the valleys on in, out to the coast. Uh, really something cool to check out. It's where I get a lot of the pictures and documents of residential gardens that I use in my presentations. And it's coming up next month, April 23rd and 24th. Uh, you can check out the information if you go to nativeplantgardentour.org. So if you're thinking about putting in a native garden or working with native plants, I highly recommend that you take the time to go and do that. I'm typing the link into the chat right now. Uh, you get to talk to homeowners. There's other docents, who, you know, knowledgeable volunteers, and things like that as well. So you can ask questions. And a lot of times they have signs on the plants and stuff like that. Uh, so here, get back to it. What I mentioned kind of building a sense of depth and layering, that's kind of what starts to happen with the medium-sized shrubs. So you have a tree your medium sized shrubs, maybe a, a background layer, and then closer to the paths or in other niches, uh, smaller plants as well. And so some of these shrubs here are pruned to stay to size, but you can see kind of naturalistic style done quite in a lovely way. And so here, for example, that pigeon point coyote brush that I mentioned earlier, this definitely gets some pruning to not overgrow the path, but they still have about five feet, which is about as uh, minimum space I would want to grow these plants. And what I was mentioning earlier with the color contrast of the foliage, even though they're just starting to come into flower. So we'll talk about these plants individually as well. This is a picture from uh, my front yard where you can see, again, working with the smaller plants and then ornamental grasses, larger ornamental grasses in the back, and then kind of moving into the shrub layer. So kind of building a little bit of that depth foreground, background, and then over time, uh, that coffee berry hedge that I mentioned has now started to grow as the darker, taller background layer over here. So, and things change throughout the seasons. So one of my favorite, if you have room for it, medium-sized shrub, medium in height, can get quite wide, are, is a, a series of hybrids of native sages, which are all very, very similar, almost impossible to tell apart. Uh, that would be Alan Chickering Sage, Pozo Blue Sage, or Whirly Blue Sage. I will use the exact same plant for the exact same purpose uh, in the garden, just depends on which one the nursery has when I'm looking for it. They are, are for all intents and purposes, pretty much identical. Uh, they are fine in full blasting sun, they do need full sun. They don't take part shade or they don't perform well in part shade. One of the best smelling plants 
ever. Uh, pollinators and hummingbirds love the spring flowers. And after that, if you let the flowers dry out and develop seed, then small songbirds will use the seeds after that, goldfinches and other small birds. And these great, beautiful clusters of gorgeous, gorgeous flowers. They can get quite large though. They, they'll be with the flowers, uh, you know, maybe like rib height, you know, not, not shoulder height, uh, maybe to the bottom of, of average size person's ribs, uh, maybe a little bit taller than that. But this particular sage, especially if you're growing it inland, if it's happy, can get 10 feet wide. Uh, it's one that if you look at what the nurseries and their write-ups or their plant tags say how wide it will get, they'll sometimes say four to five feet or five to six feet. It'll get wider than that inland for sure. But with pruning once a year, you can keep it to probably about six feet. If you don't have at least six feet and the room to let it seasonally grow a little bit wider and then cut it back, you might need to go with the smaller sage. But if you have the room for this, absolutely lovely. White sage is a local native to where I work. Sage and where I live, it is a little bit smaller and has a very different kind of flowering effect. Uh, full blasting sun is absolutely fine for it. Smells amazing. Great for pollinators, hummingbirds, songbirds as well. I have a white sage next to the patio space in my backyard and the goldfinches spend months after the flowers uh, finish, picking every single individual little seed out of the dried flower clusters and eating them. So lots of bird watching from the white sage, uh, beautiful foliage, important ecological habitat plant, uh, beautiful kind of effect when the color catches it. And it is, it's a common plant, so it's not listed as endangered, but in our local areas, it is threatened because uh, people who should not uh, illegally harvest it to uh, burn sage, and that has caused significant negative impacts on our local populations of them in some areas. Uh, this is the most common sage in Southern California that was used by uh, Southern California indigenous peoples for burning or smudging. Uh, and so for people who have uh, taken that up who are, are not from those groups, uh, the unsustainable harvesting of these sages has become an issue. If you are someone who is going to uh, burn sage, do not harvest it from the wild. It's very easy to grow your own if you are going to do that. Uh, and also if you purchase it, you never know where it's harvested from unless you truly know the collection practices. So safer to grow it yourself. Uh, so on to other notes, uh, another real backbone of much of Southern California's uh, wild plant ecology is California buckwheat, which also, if you have the space, can make a great garden plant. Super easy, uh, truly can grow without irrigation uh, after it's established and transitioned into the garden. Uh, I have one on the west side of my house, right next to asphalt driveway, it gets lots of punishing reflected heat. And I do water a couple of the shrubs nearby, and so it must have its roots into it, but I never directly intentionally water it, and you wouldn't know the difference. It's just perfectly happy growing where it grows. Uh, full sun is okay. Has a long bloom season in many Southern California gardens, it's going to bloom much of the year, but with its biggest bloom in late summer into fall, Really important for pollinators and butterflies. Birds eat the seed, larval host plants for many butterflies. Really easy to grow, but this is another one that will often get larger than uh, the nursery guides might mention. Uh, can be eight, 10 feet wide over time. Very easy to prune. You can cut it back hard. You can cut it back almost to you know just a, a couple of inches 
and it will grow back. There is one in our park, which literally uh, was run over by a, a truck that decided to drive out of the parking lot into the park. And after cutting it all the way back, has grown back in less than a year and is a beautiful small shrub again. Super, super tough. Uh, just make sure that you control the size if you need to. If you have a wide open space, sometimes it can seed a little aggressively. I don't normally see it happen in home gardens. Uh, for example, I've not had it happen in uh, home gardens that, or any home gardens that I've had, uh, but at our park where we have a, a wide open, more commercial sized space and we do a lot less kind of very light maintenance out in our park planting, uh, it can seed somewhat aggressively. Lovely plant though, but pretty easy to stay on top of if it seeds in your home garden. And as the flower clusters fade, they start to turn kind of this beautiful rust color and you just leave it on. This is not the kind of plant where you have to like deadhead and cut things off. And then eventually there's a, a nice contrast between the rust colored dried flowers and the fresh new ones. And you can even uh, cut them for dried flower arrangements and they'll hold for a very long time. And I'm going to mention, I see some questions that have come in. I'm going to mention one other buckwheat, which is a kind of cousin of the local California native buckwheat, which is Santa Cruz Island buckwheat. And then we'll do the questions. Um, but it has a lot of the same factors, but a different look than our local native California buckwheat. Santa Cruz Island buckwheat is from the Channel Islands. And it has a lighter color foliage and wider flower clusters that I love our native California buckwheat, but this is just a little bit more ornamental. Blooms for a lot of the year, uh, has all of the same habitat benefits, even though it's not local native. It is from Southern California or Southern-ish California. Uh, and I've had these two planted right across pathways from each other and watched the same you know, beneficial insects uh, using the flowers of both species for the same purpose. Uh, Full blasting sun, long bloom season, important for the wildlife, very similar, just a different look. Uh, and I like to have both of them in most gardens that I plant. So before we move on, let's cover some questions. Okay, for the sages, white sage, pozo, blue, do they get ragged looking over time and require annual pruning or can they be planted with no pruning? It depends on the look you are going for. Most home gardeners, will prune uh, once per year after the flowering season is done in the fall to do a little bit of cleanup. And for me, that means you know, flowers, but I've also let the seed develop and let the birds pick through it. And I'll do it fall to early winter just to kind of clean it up some before it starts pushing its growth for the next spring blooming season. Occasionally, people who want things to stay super, super clean looking will prune after the first round of flowering finishes, and then it might flower again one more time, but you, you lose your seed production if you do that. And, and part of my motivation, and I think people's motivation should be for this kind of gardening is to let the birds eat some of the seeds. So most people will do it just once per year. Uh, you absolutely can grow it if you don't need to do any size control. Uh, you absolutely can do it without any pruning. Uh, but most people want to prune twice, uh, once a year. We do very little pruning uh, out in our park planting that I just mentioned. A uh, little bit of size control, but don't do like the deadheading or cut back nearly as much for the Pozo Blue or Allen Chickering Sage, and they look fine. The White Sage, because they have those very long flower stalks, uh, most people will eventually, at least once per year, cut those out, even if you're not really doing any other pruning. I mean, they they kind of eventually, after they dry out, will break apart and kind of self-prune. That's what they do when they're out in the wild. Uh, but it's really easy and helps things generally look a little bit nicer uh, in terms of most people's aesthetic if you do a little bit of pruning in the garden once a year for some cleanup. Uh, okay, so from... Uh, other question is, my, gar my yard slash garden is lovely, wondering how much time I spend on maintenance. Uh, so the pictures I've shown are my front yard, which is 1,200 square feet, and I do very little maintenance on that now that it's established. Uh, there's a lot of Bermuda grass lawns 
on the cul-de-sac that I live on that sometimes go to seed. So even though we did a very thorough job uh, removing our lawn, there's always a little bit of Bermuda grass and sometimes some dandelions also from the, the neighbor's lawns that come up. So throughout most of the year, every two to three weeks, I'll do 20 minutes of weeding or something like that. Uh, a lot of weeks I don't do anything. And then honestly, sometimes I'll fall behind and then I'll do like after six weeks, I'll maybe do half an hour to an hour of weeding uh, because the Bermuda grass you really need to try to pull out. But if we didn't have those weeds kind of coming in from the, the neighboring lawns, very little most of the year. And then more hours over a weekend or two of some seasonal cleanup uh, in the fall is yeah mostly it occasionally with some of the ground cover yarrow we'll do a little bit more detail i'll sometimes cut that back not every year but just to freshen it up uh so not a lot my backyard is huge and we basically have our own botanical garden back there and veggies and fruit trees so a lot of maintenance in the back uh but that's because we didn't set the back up to be low maintenance uh so yeah hopefully that helps Uh, okay. And one very specific question, but I will take the time. We're doing pretty well on time for it. Uh, just as an example, two large planters, six by eight by four, one under the shade of an oak tree, the other in full sun, medium evergreen bush can plant and ultimately not water. Uh, You, I would say that there are, I mean, the Eve case coffee berry for uh, one that can be underneath the oak uh, is an easy one to recommend in most cases. Uh, lots of things you can do in the full sun one. And if you just have like a couple of shrubs underneath an oak tree, you know, to ultimately, if you need to give them a little bit of water once a month, uh, just kind of at their base, but not wetting the whole root zone of the oak. In most cases, the oak will be okay as long as it's just occasionally. But, you know, you can generally go with you know, a lot of the natives that can take full shade, but coffee berry would be one of my defaults for underneath an oak tree for a shrub that can take that. Okay, let's keep it moving. So this showy penstemon, one of my favorite, this is really a large perennial plant that can be quite tall. So I put it in the shrub category because most of the perennials that I mentioned, you can really use them like up at the edges of paths or things like that. This one tend, I tend to use more back in the landscape among the shrubs because when it's in bloom, the top of these flower stalks could be, if it's happy, four feet tall, occasionally even taller. So I tend to mix it in with shrubs. And then this is one that generally after it's done blooming uh, might get cut back because that will help it from kind of falling apart over time in the garden. The seeds, uh, the flower stalks are so long. And then it just becomes a little kind of green mass that you don't notice even that much in the garden until it comes into bloom again. But it's a gorgeously flowering tall perennial. Hummingbirds and pollinators absolutely love the flowers. I'll, I'll let it go for a while so that the seeds can develop. Birds will eat the seeds. And the foliage, even though it might not be that noticeable after it's cut back, uh, is host to many butterfly species. And so it's, here you can see the most, this is part of my front yard. The most common way that I'll use it is in between other shrubs. So I have, we'll talk about deer grass later, but a section where there's a number of deer grass, large bunch grasses, and then just kind of intermixed in between, I have three or four of these. And you almost don't even notice them when they're cut back. But in the sp later spring, you get these, this nice kind of billowy, purple, flowery kind of visual effect and lots and lots of hummingbirds and pollinators using them. Moving on to one of these desert shrubs again that I am so fond of because of the summer flowering season. And this is just a great habitat plant as well as a beautiful visual plant, a great color, uh, so many reasons. Can take the full blasting sun, blooms much of the warm season. Uh, it will, this one has gotten a lot of 
pruning to stay this compact. It's a very clean looking one. Oftentimes they kind of just grow and flop however they want. It's not a very structural plant, but it provides a lot of color in the garden. And so I'll use it sometimes nearby kind of more structural plants. And then it is kind of another one that's like a big flowering perennial, but of a shrub size. But you can prune back whenever you need it to, to keep it looking good. I wouldn't do that in the middle of the winter, uh, but oftentimes when it's done flowering in the fall, it can get a cut back. And even midsummer, if it seems like it's kind of flowered itself out, uh, I'll cut, this is one that I will cut back and then it'll put on more growth and, and flower again by the fall usually. Flowers are used by pollinators and butterflies, and it's a really important uh, larval host plant as well. The mallows, and this is a mallow family plant, are really important to butterflies. Lovely, lovely up close, and pollinators as well love to crawl into these flowers and crawl around and get covered in this pollen. Another mallow is called Palmer's mallow. Uh, this has some similarities, and it is another true desert California native plant. It has a wider, fuzzier, more silvery leaf that, because of that fuzz, kind of catches the light in a really special way. It has orange, almost yellowish sometimes, but an orange flower that's different. It's lighter than the other one and has many of the same habitat benefits. Between the two, the desert mallow, at least in inland climates, is a little bit easier to grow. And I, although I don't have any scientific evidence to back it up, I think functions as a little bit uh, more beneficial of a habitat plant, just in terms of who I see visiting it and how often. But this is also an amazing plant as well. I have them both in my garden at home. And yeah, absolutely, absolutely lovely. Going into smaller shrubs, and this is one that's great for either part shade or in one of my favorite plants for the north facing side of a house, north facing side of a garage, where it can take a lot of shade much of the year, but can handle some high sun in the summer, is creeping Oregon grape. You can think of this as a smaller cousin than, or a smaller cousin of the golden abundance Oregon grape that we mentioned earlier. A lot of the same qualities, but this one is generally about knee high and called creeping because it does very slowly spread from the roots and move out, but it's very easy to control the size. Uh, best inland not to be in full blasting sun all day. Beautiful foliage that in the cool weather, especially if after like a, a frost will kind of tinge purple. So you get a, this, like you see on the uh, image, really, really lovely kind of unique color effect. Those beautiful yellow flowers in the early spring, followed by very similar blueberries to the golden abundance Oregon grape later in the spring. Absolutely lovely plant. I'll, I'll use a whole row of these sometimes up against the north side of the house including uh, my own house for part of the north facing side. And then another plant for full blasting sun, uh, incredible shrub, local native here in the Inland Empire, which also grows uh, natively out into the desert, kind of transitions between the Mediterranean climate and the, the true desert. It's a native sunflower. We have a number of native sunflowers and it grows on a bush uh, with light colored foliage. Uh, this is one, another one that in our inland heat, especially if it gets even a, a bit of water after it's established, tends to get quite a bit larger than the nursery uh, write-ups will say, uh, up to eight feet wide maybe without pruning, but you can prune it to keep it smaller. And the sunflowers can take hard pruning. So in the fall, you can basically cut them back almost to the ground to kind of just a very, very little, not much above the soil. And in the vast majority of cases, they will vigorously grow right back out. They can, you can prune them in the spring, they will survive. But if you prune them right before they flower, uh, their flowering will be delayed until quite a bit later in the season. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, some things about brittle bush, but, but it, it is so lovely, so floriferous, uh, flowers are adored, adored by butterflies and pollinators. The birds will come back and eat the seed later on. 
And it seems like in the gardens that I've spent time in, in the larger ones, the birds like to hang out in the branches uh, as well and then come out and do their things. And there's just something about the branching structure that they really like to seem to uh, spend time in. So absolutely, absolutely lovely plant. Uh, these are ones that you can absolutely just stop watering them after they're established in your garden. Uh, I see these having recolonized uh, freeway you know, plantings that weren't successful and the sprinklers are, are not on anymore. They're just capped off. And in the late spring, early summer, it's just this in California buckwheat on no irrigation, looking better than any of the other freeway plantings in the area. So that's great. They will spread lightly by seed in your garden, spread around by birds. Uh, normally that's just fine, but they're also very easy to pull out if they start growing in places where you don't want them. Uh, yeah, brittle bush. So yeah, the one I have in my yard, uh, its roots probably get some water from some plants nearby that we water once a month, but I haven't directly watered it in a very long time and it is perfectly happy. Black sage is one you might want to consider in your yard if you have space. It's not as much of a go-to for me as the other two sages I mentioned earlier, but there are a couple of reasons why it did make it onto this list. Uh, if you are providing irrigation for it, uh, you really are gonna wanna have space like at least eight feet over time in a residential yard. It does really thrive in an area where maybe it doesn't get any direct irrigation, but its roots you know, farther away from it are in an area that maybe gets some irrigation. In our inland heat, even though it will grow natively in inland heat areas, uh, it tends to go into that summer dormancy if it doesn't get some supplemental water. But if you give it too much supplemental water directly, it's going to want to be like 12 feet plus wide and just really get huge. But there's a few lovely things about it. It's as an individual plant, not directly as showy as some of the other sages, but it tends to bloom depending on the time of year you're thinking about either later or earlier than some of the other sages. And so it can be a great addition for habitat. You'll have the sage flowers that the pollinators and butterflies love for more of the year if you have room to include one. Uh, the birds will also eat the seed. It's a good larval habitat plant. It does smell absolutely amazing with a bit of a different smell than the other sages. And then visually, it also has a darker leaf color. And so that kind of can give you some contrast with the, the lighter leaf colors of things like the other sages or the brittle bush we looked at or things like that. There are a few, uh, if you're looking at different sages available at nurseries, uh, there's a few other hybrids. Occasionally you can find a, a smaller version although not always, so I don't put those on the list because I don't want to send you out looking for things you can't find. But this is definitely one to be on your radar for some specific characteristics. And here is a sage that is not a California native plant. This is from Mexico, but is on the list for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it's very commonly available. Uh, but two, even though I am really, really mostly a fan for water-wise uh, plants of sticking with uh, mainly California natives. This sage blooms for so much of the year. And in fact, I've had this in gardens where all of the other native sages are done blooming for the season, but this sage is still in full bloom. And so lots of the native pollinators and tiny beneficial insects that might have been on the native sages earlier in the season have then gone over to this plant that's still in bloom. So it, it extends uh, the season a little bit for that sage genus flowers and the critters that like it. Uh, there is the, the normal species, the normal Mexican sage can get quite large. Uh, this one, I would not put it this close to the walkway because it's gonna continue throughout the season to grow more and more over the walkway. Uh, but it's a nice example of the plant. Uh, nor the, the normal species will be in inland heat at least, six, maybe eight feet wide, uh, five feet tall when it's in bloom. But there is a dwarf selection that I use a little bit more called Santa Barbara Mexican sage, and that's going to be more knee high by about six feet wide. As it progresses through the season, 
and it goes into the fall and winter, the bottom part of the stems tend to lose its leaves and it starts to get pretty leggy looking, but it is cut back almost to the ground every year in the winter or spring. So all of the old branches get cut back and then by that time you'll see the new fresh growth at the base is, is how really to, it has to be treated to keep it looking good in the garden, which makes it more maintenance than some of the other sages. So if I'm just doing a few, uh, I'll always stick with the natives, but I, I did put this in as an option. And then bunch grasses are also quite useful in the garden, both aesthetically and ecologically. Uh, my most common go-to for a native bunch grass is deer grass. Uh, individual plants themselves are going to be the foliage part once they're mature in most gardens for maybe five feet wide. But something important to remember is these beautiful flower stalks tend as they mature to lay down out to the side. And so you can see here, these, this is a, a young hedge of them that I uh, put into a design. And you can see as they age, they start to kind of lay down. And so in another year or so, many more of these will be all the way down. And these only need to be cut back every two to three years, but oftentimes uh, people will plant them a little too close to a walkway. And then the things need to start getting cut back here. It's a wider, it's more of a parking area. So there's a little bit of room, but you can see how I left a little bit of space here uh, where the foliage doesn't go up to the edge. That's to accommodate for that. So these will pretty regularly, including the flowers be six feet wide. Uh, you can have them closer to other plants in the garden because it's just fine if the flowers interact with the foliage of a nearby shrub, but I always will plant them at least three feet off of the edge of a walkway to accommodate for that. Uh, they look really nice. They are likely host plant to skipper butterflies, which use a lot of the uh, grasses, uh, hasn't necessarily been observed in the scientific literature, but most likely it, it is the case. And the smallest of seed eating birds that we get in our local yards, uh, small birds like goldfinches, really love the seeds. If you have these in your yards in most parts of Southern California, seasonally, the goldfinches will show up and they'll land on each of these flower stems and pick out each seed. And even though they're very lightweight, that's enough that the goldfinches themselves and the branches of the, or the seed stem start swaying around. Absolutely lovely. And so that gets us through the, those top kind of medium sized shrubs or semi shrub like plants. And so now we're gonna kind of zero in on some of the smaller plants. And so as we think about that depth in the landscape and how you would build out your landscape plan, because I mentioned for a lot of these shrubs how they can get quite big, even when you look at the range of them in some of the best information, it still might say four to six feet wide or four to seven feet wide. There's always a pretty big range on the shrubs. And so when we're thinking about how our walkways, our sidewalks, the, our patio spaces might interact with those larger shrubs, in some cases, it's nice to have them at the edge for a larger patio space, maybe kind of blurs the edge of the patio and the landscape. But if you have a three foot wide walkway, you don't want to plant a shrub that might grow three feet wider, make your walkway impassable, or you don't want to block the sidewalk. And so oftentimes at the edges, we'll rely primarily on smaller plants, generally known as perennials, that the size is a little bit more predictable. Uh, and then as it steps back into the landscape, we'll start working with a layering of larger plants. We'll also use perennial plants in between the larger plants where we want things to be a little bit lower for whatever reason. And we have lots of great choices. One of my very favorites is a, another buckwheat, the smallest of the buckwheats that we're going to talk about today, which is red buckwheat, a cousin of the California buckwheat or the island buckwheat. This one is also from the Channel Islands. And this one is low water, but can also tolerate a little bit more water. So it's, it's great to also use in a medium water transition zone. I've sometimes used it under and near fruit trees where it gets a little bit of that extra water and it does quite well. I have one in my backyard near a bird bath where it gets some extra water and it's extremely happy. Uh, but it is 
relatively predictable in size and easy to prune even if it gets a little bit wider. A two to three feet uh, maximum usually has these very cool flowers which come in these strange clusters. It's almost an alien looking plant. Pollinators and butterflies love the flowers, a larval host plant for some of the butterfly species, the birds eat the seed. Individual plants might not be that long lived in the garden, maybe occasionally, you know, only a year or so, often two to three years, but it will self seed and spread some in the garden. So oftentimes by the time the plant is in decline, it will have drop seed and that seed will have germinated even without a lot of additional water, uh, just naturally as the garden is maintained or even in, in seasonal rains. And so you'll have young, very healthy, vigorous seedling plants that are going to very quickly grow and replace the one that dies. It's kind of, it uh, doesn't spread as much as like uh, annual wildflowers like California poppies or things like that. But oftentimes if you plant a few, even five years down the line, if those individual plants are gone, you'll still have them nearby in your garden, which is absolutely lovely. And then they'll also come up in my garden in the spaces where I wouldn't have thought to plant them or couldn't have planted them like in between rocks at the edge of my dry stream bed or things like that. Uh, it can take full sun, but in hot inland uh, environments, it will often look its best for more of the year with some afternoon shade or even in dappled shade. So I have them in my front yard, for example, and the cluster of them that I have where they get some afternoon shade from a coffee berry shrub stays looking vigorous for more of the year and blooms more prolifically than the one that I have that gets uh, full sun and reflected heat from the driveway in the afternoon. That one's still doing all right, uh, but it doesn't thrive quite as much as the other one. Here's a close-up of the flowers, quite beautiful. And my other top small perennial plant is a small penstemon. And this is, so in some ways, like a small cousin of that showy penstemon, not called showy penstemon, but a very showy plant. This is Margarita Bop penstemon. It's a selection of a penstemon that's local, locally native to much of Southern California. This is a small grouping of them. I don't know exactly how many plants, but individual plants are often a foot and a half to two feet wide, occasionally a little bit wider. It can take that full blasting sun. It can also take part shade. It's great for uh, parkways, you know, parking strips kind of close to the street, along driveways I'll often use it. I have this where the driveway meets the front walk of, of my front yard, uh, and it just loves, loves life there. Uh, spring to summer flowering, hummingbirds and pollinators love the flowers, uh, good for butterflies, and also can take a little bit more water. So I've actually occasionally used it uh, kind of near fruit trees as well and does just fine. Here it is grown in the pot and just gorgeous color. You can't even take a picture of how lovely the, the flower color is. It's a purple, but with this like iridescent blue color mixed in as well. Also on my list, a little bit, I'm not gonna say tricky to grow, I'll say a little bit uh, less consistent of a garden plant. Uh, meaning, for example, if I plant five of these, uh, oftentimes one of them for whatever reason might up and die in the first year. Uh, we have two of them underneath the desert willow out in front of the Waterwise Community Center. One of them is just an absolute showstopper of a plant. The other one kind of muddles along. But the cool thing about them, just like the red buckwheat, is that after you have them for a couple of years, they'll often set seed and you'll have more coming up in your yard. And the seedlings that come up in your, your yard will tend to be more vigorous and happier uh, than the ones you transplanted. And so it's a little bit of an, an investment to get them going sometimes, uh, but then they are absolutely lovely. This is a true desert penstemon, and it can be good for full blasting sun to part shade. I've seen them growing in habitat in slot canyons uh, in the Nevada desert. And so they kind of do like that little bit of partial shade sometimes, but are, are good in full sun as well. Uh, spring to summer flowering, loved by pollinators and hummingbirds, and good for butterflies uh, as well for the larval host plant. It's a little bit taller than the margarita bot penstemon. The margarita bot penstemon to me is, is, is really kind of like a 
sure thing and I'll plant a grouping of three of them or five of them and, and it can grow into a lovely mass. This one I'll kind of more dot here or there and usually they'll live, but if they happen to not live, you know, it's not really going to cause like a visual gap in the landscape. And eventually when they do see it, I'll let some of them grow and they can just kind of come up here and there and be wonderful when they're in flower. And then getting a little bit larger, one of my other very favorite perennial plants, and I put at least one in, in most gardens that I do, is Delamina verbena. This is a California native verbena. Delamina is a particular cultivar, which tends to have a more reliably purple flower uh, and a little bit of a cleaner look. This is, in terms of providing nectar for adult butterflies, probably the top butterfly nectar plant you can grow in Southern California. I mean, this when things are tiny little one gallon plants and just have a couple of little blooms in them, haven't even been put into the ground yet or on the day that they're planting, butterflies will already be coming to check them out and get a sip. Uh, pollinators love the flowers too. It can bloom almost year round in some gardens in Southern California. It definitely slows down in midwinter, but in full bloom pretty early in the spring, down into early summer for sure. Slows down a little bit in summer. Sometimes it keeps going, sometimes it, it stops. And then usually there's a fall bloom as well. Full sun to part shade. Inland, it will bloom the longest with sun most of the day, but maybe a little bit of that afternoon shade, but can take full sun. They do go a little bit summer dormant, meaning that uh, even if you have the perfect conditions, it's just not going to look at its peak in the summer. It'll look a little bit dried out sometimes, even if it gets water. Uh, but then off, usually it comes back and starts looking great in the fall again. You can do a little bit of pruning uh, if you want to clear out some of the drier stuff and they, it can take extra water. So normally it does grow uh, just fine with, with fruit trees in my experience, especially with well-drained soil. Uh, the flowers are absolutely lovely. Here it is in my front yard. And then speaking of nectar plants for butterflies, here is my other top nectar plant for butterflies. This is yarrow. Yarrow is a local native plant, so it can grow in a variety of different conditions. It can grow in full sun, but to stay looking good year round, we'll want a little bit more irrigation than most of our native plants uh, to stay looking you know, kind of not drought stressed year round in full sun, at least inland. So in my front yard, I'll water the entire front yard, usually about once a month in the dry, warm season. But I will, depending on the time of year, then sometimes just get out there with a hose and give the area of yarrow that you'll see on the next slide a little bit of supplemental water, maybe every uh, a couple of weeks. So maybe a supplemental water in between. If you really want to keep it looking you know, super good, maybe you'd even do that once a week uh, in the summer, make sure it gets irrigated. I don't really, I'd rather go for more water conservation and uh, I'm fine. Last summer, kind of as an experiment, I gave it very, very little supplemental water, except on, on really, really hot times of year. And it kind of partially died back. But then as soon as things cooled off in the fall, it started growing back quite vigorously again. So in my front yard, that's probably more of what I will be doing. Just depends on the aesthetic of what you want to do. Uh, Part shade, it definitely stays quite, quite a bit greener. Uh, where I mostly see it in habitat in inland Southern California is either in dappled shade at the edge of like an oak tree canopy or sometimes in um, north facing areas where it stays a little bit shady. Uh, it can take as much water as, as it'll get and it will thrive with extra water. It just doesn't necessarily need it. So it's great in wet to dry transition areas or even areas that flood like down at the bottom of a, a dry stream bed that maybe does get inundated with water for a day after it rains. Uh, it, with supplemental irrigation, it'll work well in parkways. I've planted and I've also seen parkways or parking strips where it's just basically a carpet of yarrow. In that case, it will want water pretty regularly, uh, a good soak about once a week. It does spread 
pretty actively from the roots, especially in irrigated areas. So use it where you want it to fill in open areas, but you might need to be prepared to pull it out once or a couple of times a year if it's growing into places you don't want it. I'll often grow it in between larger shrubs and it'll fill in the space underneath the shrubs, but it's not so aggressive that'll outcompete the shrubs or anything like that. Uh, and yeah, adored by butterflies and pollinators. So here it is in my front yard in the area that I have it. So at the base of this bird bath, and there is a little bit of a path that's kind of hard to see that you can kind of walk through that instead of just having the path be uh, mulch because it's not, it's only really walked through when I'm doing uh, work in the garden. I don't spend a lot of time out in the front yard. So it, uh, it can take some light foot traffic, no problem at all. So I just walk through it when I need to. Uh, you know, you wouldn't want to be playing soccer on it every day, but a little bit of light foot traffic, if you want to use it as a secondary walkway, no problem at all. And so, yeah, that's kind of how I use it as a patch. And you can see how it's growing in kind of even into underneath the sage right here, but it's not going to grow all the way up into it or cause any problems. I'm not going to have to pull it out down there as maintenance or anything like that. If you are, is in a place where you're going to give it a little bit of extra water, it's a great plant to grow in situations like this at the edge of a driveway, especially if you have those drivers at your house where, you know, sometimes a, a car wheel would go over the edge of the lawn or depending on the geometry of your space. Uh, a lot of the small native plants that are perennials, you know, that'll break branches and they won't recover very well from that. Like I wouldn't put a red buckwheat right here if that was the case, but the yarrow, uh, just based on how it grows and the nature of the plant you know, is going to be okay if it every once in a while, you know, a wheel goes over it. Uh, it'll, it'll grow back from that just fine. And ladybugs, absolutely love them. There's something about the foliage that they like to hang out in there. The next yarrow is a European cousin of the common yarrow. The common yarrow that we just looked at is native to California, but it's also native to much of the world. Then uh, there are many species of yarrow in the world. And moonshine yarrow is a cultivar of a European species. And the reason why it shows up in my top list is because it actually performs a little bit better with a little bit less water in full blasting sun than our native yarrow does. And it doesn't spread from the roots like our native yarrow does. It kind of gets 18 inches to maybe two feet wide, uh, but doesn't spread beyond that. Some people love this yellow flower color. Uh, for me, it's a little bit loud. It's not my favorite flower color, but it is a wonderful plant, has a, a lovely uh, light color foliage, a lot of flower color for not a lot of work. Most of the time it's just cut back about once a year to clean it up some. Can take that full blasting sun, uh, low water. It's probably gonna want water uh, every other week to really stay happy. It, generally, it's probably not a, like a only once a month watering. If you are in hot inland Southern California, works well in parkways and it is liked by butterflies and pollinators. And another absolutely lovely small perennial way to fill space along edges or in between shrubs in the Waterwise Garden in Southern California is California fuchsia. This one can spread quite a bit it can get into be a little bit of a hot mess of a plant, but its benefits really make it worth it. And I would grow this at least somewhere in most gardens, uh, I think. It can take full blasting sun, full sun, or even a little bit of part shade. It won't flower as much in part shade, but it can, it can tolerate summer, morning sun with afternoon shade, afternoon or morning shade with afternoon sun, that's fine. And one of the reasons why I like it so much, and I think it's important to have in gardens, is because of its flowering season. It flowers late summer into fall as its primary flowering season. 
So along with the buckwheats, where you can see the California buckwheat behind it here, uh, it is coming into flower when a lot of the other native plants or waterwise plants are finishing flowering. Many years you'll get a light spring bloom. So some of the fuchsias in our garden at the Waterwise Community Center have a light bloom right now, but it's big bloom is going to be late summer and into fall. And it's adored by hummingbirds and pollinators. And so it's extending that flowering and that uh, resource of the nectar and pollen uh, into that season. It spreads by roots as well as by seed, but it's pretty easy to pull out if it ever starts growing somewhere where you don't want it. And there are some cultivars that spread a little bit less. And so depending on what's available in the, the nursery, you can research it or people at specialty nurseries can advise you as well. To keep it looking fresh in our residential gardens, what most people are going to want to do is after the flowers are done, you will cut it pretty much back to the ground in late fall or early winter after its blooms fade. And after that, it will start to put on foliage growth again, pretty rapidly, maybe late winter, early spring, and then it will look nice and fresh. If you don't do that, they tend to be not quite as vigorous in the garden. In the wild, you know, they don't care. They'll come up places, they'll be less vigorous, they'll be more vigorous in other places, but we wanna keep it looking good in our home landscapes usually. So that cutback really, really helps. And if you don't want it to spread because it can spread pretty efficiently from seed, you would just do that cut back when the flowers fade, but before the, the seeds really develop. And that's a way to help control its spread as well. It can take pruning. So here you can see uh, it here. It's obviously get some pruning here to keep the pathway open, but responds to it quite well and looks lovely. Next plant is a Texas native actually, uh, but grows very well in Southern California. It's red yucca. And I include it because it is a great plant for that full punishing, hot, hot heat, reflected sun, and it grows very well in parkways. Uh, it basically turns heat into flowers and gets these large flowers. The plant itself over time might be uh, thigh high and the flower is quite a bit taller and it goes for a lot of the warm season and it's absolutely loved by hummingbirds as opposed to, it's called red yucca, but it's not a true yucca, as opposed to many other uh, succulents or yuccas or agaves or things like that. It doesn't really have spines. Uh, so it's also safe in terms of people walking by in the neighborhood and things like that to have out in a parkway reflected heat sort of situation. Another uh, plant native to Baja, not to California. And I, I think even in Baja, it's not quite considered part of the California floristic province, but works very well in a water wise garden is Mexican daisy or Santa Barbara daisy, goes by both names. It grows in full sun to part shade. In full sun, it's probably gonna want water about twice a month to really stay looking good. Uh, so a little bit more than most native gardens or in part shade, it might be able to be fine with less. Uh, great in wet to dry transition areas. It's great near, under and around fruit trees. And the reason why it's in the list is it blooms nearly year round and it is adored by beneficial insects. You can see the close-up of the flowers that go year round. And kind of going from something that's very flowery to something that's a little bit more common green, this is, I'm gonna explain it as two plants. Basically there is a plant and we're talking about the smaller green one here, sometimes called Berkeley sedge, sometimes it's called European gray sedge. Occasionally you see it called uh, foothill sedge. And it, goes by all those names because there's two incredibly closely related plants, one of which is truly native to California, one of which is from Europe, but they both look and function in the landscape. And also uh, the even the European one is probably mixed in a bit in the wild in California. Uh, and they were grown by the nursery industry and sold uh, as the same plant for a long time until some graduate student looked at tiny flowering parts with a microscope and identified them as two different species. So sometimes even the native plant nurseries will technically uh, be growing the European 
one, but they function the same way in the landscape and essentially in terms of for landscape purposes in a home garden, ecologically the same. So I just lump them together because quite honestly, uh, no matter what the label is, you, you never quite know which one you're going to get. And that's, that's just fine. It's, it's not something to get hung up about, but I wanted to include both names because uh, you might see it listed either way at a nursery. And this is, here we see a close spacing that's probably cut back a little bit more often. And here is the same plant. Uh, this is actually my parents' backyard where you see it with a little bit of a wider spacing and it's cut back less and it gets a little bit larger. It, so here they're probably planted about uh, 18 inches apart. To me, at least with inland heat, they often grow a little bit larger than that. And I'll plant them at least two feet apart. Uh, individual plants might get larger than that. I normally planted at least a foot and a half off the edge of a walkway because I have had them in, in ones that I have planted get at least three feet wide. And I don't like to have to do a lot of extra cutback right along walkways because then the plants look kind of awkward. It grows best and stays greenest year round in part shade to shade inland. It can take full sun with some extra water. Uh, full sun with afternoon shade is normally just fine. It's great in northern facing areas or even areas that seasonally flood like down in dry stream beds. Uh, it's a larval host plant for skipper butterflies. It's great in a wet to dry transition. It, it will be fine with any amount of water it gets, but we tend to use it for a nice green meadowy look in areas that don't require a lot of water. Uh, if you are growing it in full sun inland, it'll probably get watered uh, once a week to every other week, but if it's in shade inland, in a lot of cases, once a month after it's established will be just fine. Uh, usually works well under trees that are hard to garden under. It, it works well. I wouldn't do it this densely, but or this densely, but just as one here, one there to have a nice green mound, it'll even grow underneath evergreen oak trees like Coast Live Oak, and then can be you know, very little water after it's established. And another kind of low ground cover option, this is for full sun, is this succulent uh, called blue finger, sometimes called blue chalk sticks, uh, Senecio mandrelaceae. There's a couple of small, uh, both different Senecios that have this sort of look. Either one can kind of be used the same. And this quite honestly doesn't do all that much ecologically, but sometimes I do know that gardeners who plant mostly native plants uh, feel like they don't have a lot of options for large kind of edges along sidewalks and things like that. You can always do seasonal annual wildflowers, which is great, but for something more permanent, uh, I love the buckwheats and penstemons, but they can be, if you have a, like if you have 50 feet to do, uh, it can be quite an investment to get enough buckwheats and penstemons to fill that space. What I would normally do is I would just do a uh, scattering of them here and there and maybe fill in with some wildflowers. But in certain cases, the landscape might call for something kind of more permanent. And this is one option. So here you do see this is a mostly, it's a mixed, but we have native uh, manzanitas and sages in the back. We have, it had just been cut back, but it's starting to grow back that Mexican sage. And then we have the blue finger along the edge. Here is another mix of water-wise plants and kind of driveway edge using that blue finger plant as the ground cover. And there's many, many other plants that are all lovely and could have worked that you can check out in the Inland Valley Garden Planner for those sorts of situations. And so now kind of getting closer towards the end of the workshop, we're gonna transition from those big categories, trees, shrubs, smaller perennials, and to more kind of specific needs. Some of these are going to revisit plants that we already talked about, uh, but we're gonna talk about them a little bit different. So what are kind of top recommendations if you need a hedge? So for medium-sized hedges, coyote brush does work well, but there is also a hybrid that if you wanna to try to keep your hedge smaller and especially greener down at the ground level, will work a little bit better in many cases. This is at the Nature Gardens at the LA County Natural History Museum. And this is Centennial Coyote Brush or sometimes called Baccarus Centennial. Uh, it's a naturally occurring hybrid of 
two different baccarists and or two different coyote brushes, you can kind of say. And it just happens to stay a little bit smaller and more compact and so is more uh, adaptable to hedging to keep it kind of small. California coffee berry makes a great hedge. I already talked about it as a large hedge, but here you can see with a little bit of clipping, this is that Eve case, that dwarf coffee berry used as a more traditional foundation planting. So talking about keeping things very simple instead of uh, kind of more traditional landscape plants for foundation planting and lawn, we have Eve case coffee berry for the foundation planting. And this is a native Carex uh, lawn, and I believe we'll talk about this later on for turf alternatives. Here is Catalina Island cherry, like I mentioned, as a mature, very mature, uh, not much pruning done for size control at all, probably none kind of hedge. Toyon will also work as a hedge. This hedge will get quite a bit bigger, but I've used Toyon successfully as a hedge, uh, planted more densely than you would otherwise, but planted about six feet apart, you probably do six, seven, eight feet apart, any of those will work fine. And you can get a, a dense hedge that'll probably be 12, 15 feet-ish tall over time. That Howard McMinn manzanita can also be planted as a hedge. It grows pretty slowly, so this would take quite a number of years to grow in, but definitely an option. And then for a classic Mediterranean look, if you really wanna keep the hedge small, uh, that Centennial Coyote brush would be my go-to for that, but you can't always find that. I think it's becoming a little bit easier to find from nurseries, uh, but if you need a substitution for a, a hedge that you really want to keep small, you can try the Dwarf Myrtle. Uh, it can be hedged even like that tight, but that's quite a lot of maintenance. And then some people, just to kind of provide you with options, not my favorite, but some people would also use uh, a Australian bottle brush, a dwarf bottle brush called Little John, which can work as a small compact hedge if you can't find, I would say that like centennial coyote brush. I like to use deer grass as a hedge. We already saw this picture, but now talking about using it as a hedge, uh, I'd, to have that density, I'd probably plant it uh, four feet apart. It's so normally if I want that dense hedge without anything in between. And so other kind of specific locations that sometimes we need to do some problem solving for is that north side of houses, garages, directly on the north side of a wall or a fence. Depending on the height, it's going to be shady much of the year, but then when the sun is at its peak, it will be very high and in full sun. So things that work great in that situation. One of my favorites for a ground cover is California strawberry. California strawberry in full sun inland will tend to fry, but if it really is in full shade or in the northern exposure, after it's established can be very low water. I have some up right up against the north side of my house, just kind of filling in all the open space between the shrubs, and it gets very little supplemental water in the summer and stays amazingly green and abundant. But it can take uh, irrigation as well. So it's great for any wet to dry transition areas in the shade. Uh, I normally plant these about two feet apart and within a year or so, it will turn completely into a carpet. Here, you can see how it's grown over the sidewalk. This is does take some pruning and trimming to keep it from continuing to grow, uh, but really lovely. Get small white flowers. It does actually make strawberries. They're much smaller than the kind of cultivated strawberries. Depending on a number of factors, sometimes they don't taste like much. Sometimes their flavor is actually really good, uh, but the birds are going to eat most of them. So consider it a habitat planting in terms of the berries, and that's great. And occasionally when I'm out there and I notice one, I'll pick it and eat it, and sometimes they taste quite nice. Uh, it'll be also good underneath the canopy of a fruit tree because it can take that extra watering and kind of form a, a green carpet. Toyon, if you want a larger shrub that can take that northern exposure, Toyon is great. Coffee berry is great as well. Can't remember if I have it later on that list. If it is enough in the northern, uh, kind of like right up against the north side of the house where it really does stay shady for most of the year, you can plant hookra or coral bells. 
And if you are kind of more coastally influenced and not super hot inland, it'll work even a little bit farther away from the house on the north. Uh, here inland, if you put it a little bit farther away from the, the north side of the house, but still kind of northern exposure, what will tend to happen is it'll look awesome in the spring, but then as soon as it starts to get really hot, it'll kind of look fried. These are also great plants for just dappled uh, shade underneath trees or even underneath pretty dense shade uh, are the hookahs or coral bells. There are many, many different species, but my favorites are one that's called Maxima, also called Island Alum Root, which is this. And there are cultivars of hookra that are kind of more pink to red. And the two favorite of mine, just they're very reliable and easy to grow. One's called Wendy and one's called Rosada. Uh, and I would plant either of those if I'm looking for one that has more of a pink to red color, just depending on what I see. They're beautiful in the spring. Hummingbirds like the flowers as well. And they're even good underneath oak trees. Uh, they do require some watering. So you want to be a little bit judicious with how you, uh, how many you would put under oak trees. You don't want to have to be doing tons of watering underneath an established oak. But in terms of the shade, the root competition, all that sort of stuff, they'll, they'll grow just fine. And so here you can see this is the Hucra maxima or island alum root. Just that complexity of the color and the flowers is absolutely lovely. Here's Wendy. They can take some extra uh, shade or some extra water. So intermixing them kind of near fruit trees and that wet to dry transition. If you have fruit trees, then going fading into a water wise garden, that can work quite well too. California fescue is this silvery bunch grass here as well. Absolutely lovely. I have these on the north facing side of my house, can take the shade, can take the sunny part of the year, uh, very low maintenance, and can take water or take dry. Absolutely lovely. One of my favorites for shade to full sun is fragrant pitcher sage. This is kind of a hot mess of a plant in terms of a shrub. It is kind of more like a giant perennial. Uh, it does, it has, the stems are, are kind of like gently arching. So it doesn't have kind of a, a shrub form, but the leaves are lovely. The flowers are lovely. Uh, and it smells absolutely amazing. We have one of these in our front yard in the sunnier spot and in the hottest times of the year with the screen door open on a warm day, this very perfumey smell. You can even smell it in the house. The flowers are absolutely lovely. Hummingbirds and pollinators love them. And it can take, you can grow it underneath an oak tree in dense shade with very little water after it's established, or you can grow it in full sun and anything in between. And then sometimes you need what I'll call a sculptural accent. So uh, might be a plant where there's maybe color, there maybe is that ecological function, but you want to kind of make a visual statement in the landscape. And so plants I use for that are deer grass as well. So here is deer grass uh, planted almost entirely as a meadow. And what I did in this design is just interspersed here and there, I put one sage or one buckwheat for a little bit of variation, but mostly it was deer grass planted about five feet apart. And then every once in a while, we'd skip a deer grass and put something else in. Here it is, just a single kind of youngish one as an accent with some of the other native uh, smaller grasses intermixed. Deer grass has a Texas native cousin. That's pretty tough. More of the water twice a week in the summer in most gardens around here. I mean, sorry, twice a month instead of once a month. Uh, and wet to dry transition areas. They get this kind of gauzy, almost like cotton candy bloom in the spring and sometimes in the fall as well. And these, unlike the true deer grass, which is my default for a large bunch grass, uh, these do because of the structure of the flower to stay looking good, generally do need to be cut back once a year in the early spring. Occasionally you can skip a year just depending on how things are looking. And then some people, even with a, a kind of native or native-ish garden, really like to mix in succulents as well for that sculptural effect. And that's fine. It's not something that I normally do in my own gardens, but for some people, especially who are just getting into native plants, uh, they feel that mixing in some of the sculptural succulents helps them, especially if they're doing their own design, kind of uh, have a design that 
that maybe has a visual pop that they're looking for. And so lots of different aloes will work well for that. Aloes are uh, succulents from, usually from South Africa, sometimes from some other areas around there. They are very water wise. Uh, most of the time after the they're established, water once or twice a month will be just fine. And they're very easy to grow in sun or most of them in part shade, as long as there's good drainage. Uh, there are some aloes that are fussier, but those aren't going to be the ones that you're likely to find at a normal kind of nursery. Uh, specialty, specialty nurseries and, and their staff would be able to answer the question. Sometimes they really, really don't like summer water, just like a few of the California natives that are not on this list because they're very fussy about summer water. But normally most of the aloes that you would find at a local nursery are going to be just fine and could provide some of that succulent form and pop. Uh, coral aloe is a very common one. That's the one pictured here. And they do provide a good nectar source for hummingbirds. And a number of the aloe species actually do bloom in the winter when there's not a ton of other flowers for hummingbirds necessarily as round, around. Manzanitas are one to provide that. And so there can be a little bit of ecological function, especially for the hummingbirds, uh, even if they're not a native plant. And then for sculptural effect as well, lots of people will like to mix in uh, agaves. Here's a couple of species of agaves. There are California native agaves and there are agaves from other areas. The most common one that people can plant and it's easy to be successful with, very easy to find. And most agaves have pretty nasty spines on them, but doesn't have any spines is one called foxtail agave which grows in full sun to pretty much full shade. It's going to stay looking the best in inland conditions uh, with part shade to shade because the big soft leaves can actually burn some in full sun. That being said, in our demonstration garden, we have some in full sun in afternoon heat and they just, some of the leaves get a little crispy in summer and then we clean them up. They can also be a little frost sensitive. Normally after they're established, they're going to be just fine. But for example, we planted a few as a sculptural accent in a mostly native uh, new planting that we did. And then we got a cold snap right afterwards, just this last season. And because they were so young and tender, uh, they did get some damage, but their new growth looks fine and, and they'll grow through it. Uh, so those are uh, agaves, yeah, native ones. And then a lot of the ones that are at local nurseries that are not native are, na are uh, native to similar, similar ecologies down into uh, Mexico and some of the true desert uh, areas down there. And so those are some easy ways to have some sculptural accents. And then we get into vines. There are not a ton of great vines for the home garden native to California. Uh, one of the go-tos is California grape. Uh, this is a true grape native to California. It grows in Southern California in areas that get some amount of water pretty much year round. So it'll grow like Creekside or it'll grow where there's a seep in a hillside that is draining down into a creek or something like that. But they can they don't need a lot of water after they're established. Uh, that once a month deep irrigation after it's established will be fine in most Southern California gardens. They can tolerate shade. They will produce more fruit if you're hoping to produce fruit in full sun. The fruit is, it's a true grape. They grow in clusters, but they are tiny. Uh, they, you can harvest them and eat them, but they're so small, they're nothing like a table grape. The, the flavor can be variable. They can be pretty sweet though, uh, but the birds are going to eat a lot of them. So I consider it more of a habitat plant. And if I'm out in the garden, I might snack on a few of them as they go. But I would, uh, so I have this in my garden, for example. Uh, I built a, a very simple trellis down near the bottom wall of my backyard where we wanted to grow a big vine that would be good for uh, wildlife habitat and birds will sometimes like to shelter on the inside of these uh, because they're very vigorous and have a lot of branches and stuff like that in the summer. But we have lots of ants in our neighborhood. There's just 
Argentinian ants, the little black ones are just in lots of areas of Southern California now, no matter what you grow in your garden. And the fruit itself, after it matures, uh, if it tends to break apart and stuff, it can attract a lot of ants. So I wouldn't want this right up against my house, but lower in the yard. Uh, I love where it is down in the yard and the birds absolutely love all the fruit. It is deciduous, so it will drop all of its leaves in the winter. And generally, uh, because it is extremely vigorous, uh, even if you're growing it in kind of a semi-wild, semi-native condition, it does need significant pruning each year to kind of keep it trellis to whatever you're trellising it to, or to not have it just growing all over the place. Uh, so it does take a, a good number of hours each year generally for pruning, but most people tend to think that it is worth it to grow it. There is a hybrid cultivar. It, it was found uh, naturally between a European wine grape and our California native grape that many native nurseries carry called Rogers Red that for all intents and purposes acts just like the native grape, but it gets this beautiful fall red color. So oftentimes people who grow the native grape will choose to grow the actually the hybrid, the Rogers red one, which is the one that I have in my yard. Absolutely lovely. But what we don't have, uh, there's for people interested in uh, other uh, native vines, there are uh, different native uh, called clematis, which are cool to look into, but can be also a, kind of very seasonal. Uh, I love them, but I didn't put it on my top plant list for like the average person. They can also be hard to find. But if you need a very vigorous evergreen vine, like to swallow a fence or a wall or a whole trellis, there's not a lot of great native evergreen vines. There is one called uh, Calistegia. Uh, it's a native morning glory, which is definitely an option, but it it's never forms the, the big kind of woody structure of a super long lived kind of architectural vine. And so a non-native one that I sometimes recommend is called blood red trumpet vine. It's gonna take a little bit more water, medium water use, maybe a deep watering once a week to after it's very well established, maybe every other week inland but it is truly one that can swallow like the whole side of a building, swallow a whole trellis, provide shade over a whole trellis, and gets lots of red flowers throughout the warm season that are loved by hummingbirds. And then I believe our last category as we get to the end of the workshop is simple turf replacement. So what if you just want to continue to have a small area after you get rid of turf, or even if you're just rebuilding a garden or gar building a garden from dirt, new garden, uh, and you want a, a small area to, I don't know, have a picnic on, lay around in the grass, something like that. There are some great alternatives to a traditional turf. My go-to is Western Meadow Sedge. This is what I have at the bottom of my yard in a small meadow area. It's sedges te technically aren't grasses, uh, they're grass-like but this is a vigorous grass-like meadowy plant, can grow in full sun, two parts shade, way less water than traditional turf, especially if you're okay with it turning a little bit golden or yellowish in the summer. But if you know that that's part of the cycle, it's not unattractive, uh, that's totally, totally fine. To keep it really, really green, just a little bit of golden in the summer, we water the one in full blasting sun in our demonstration garden uh, once a week, but it, total amount of water in like any given month is kind of on par with what we water like a patch of lavender of that size. It, it is actually pretty low water. Uh, you For maintenance, most people will want to cut it back once or twice a year with a string trimmer. You can actually mow it and keep it low if you want to, but I think it's more lovely being kind of tall and wispy and you can still walk through it. With irrigation, it can spread aggressively, so you might need to do a little bit of control around the edges, uh, but if the, everything around it is quite a bit drier, and this is the only thing that you're really watering much, that will help control it as well. And it is a larval host plant for those skipper butterflies. Uh, good near fruit trees as well, it will respond to that extra water and form a green ground cover. Closer to a more traditional grass type, but you can see it's, it's a little bit bunchy, 
uh, with perfect irrigation, it will fill in and it kind of looks kind of, uh, kind of like a large, uh, or like a, not large, but like a kind of slightly taller wispier Bermuda grass. Uh, if you mow it regularly is buffalo grass. That's not a California native, but it is a Southwestern native. And it is lower water than traditional turf. Uh, very similar watering, everything I just said for the the Western Meadow Sedge, that's about how much water the buffalo grass ends up wanting as well. Uh, but this one does best in full sun, doesn't really like part shade. It does go dormant, so it does turn totally brown uh, in the coldest parts of winter, just like St. Augustine turf or something like that. But that's not necessarily unattractive as well. So here's buffalo grass uh, in the winter. Here's another buffalo grass lawn. And again, with perfect watering like you would do a normal uh, turf grass lawn, you can have it be less patchy, but most people grow it kind of pretty informally and that makes the maintenance much, much easier. And then the last one we'll talk about is yarrow. So everything I said about yarrow before holds true, but if you want to, with a little bit more water, you can do a big, large area of it and have it kind of be a big turf replacement. Oh, and then we do have one last one to get through as we finish up the workshop. And that's large scale ground covers. And so here is that dwarf, the low coyote brush that I mentioned earlier, Pigeon Point. Here you can see it's getting a little bit large. Uh, here they were probably spaced a little bit too close together. But I will say since I took this picture here, you can see they didn't quite prune it at the edge. Uh, so in a situation like this, I might do it eight feet apart and really let it take the time to grow in. But I will say that this yard has since cut these back hard, like I mentioned, you can do with coyote brush every few years. And they grew back in and they look perfectly spaced and don't cover the path anymore and look amazing. Another one that you can also mix right in with that is point cell spreader. This is a sage that's large and knee high, uh, but we'll get eight to maybe even 10 feet wide, has a lighter foliage and these very light purple flowers. And then a great ground cover that stays a little bit lower is Mrs. Beard Sage. We have this prominently featured in our park here at the Waterwise Community Center. And that's gonna be knee high at the most, uh, six to eight feet wide or a little bit more. And flowers for us here so much of the year. Uh, yeah, absolutely incredible. And then if you have the real full shade inland of something like an oak tree, one of the best ground covers that requires very little water after establishment for that is evergreen current, sometimes called Catalina perfume. This lovely, lovely ground cover uh, stays pretty low, but you really don't want it to get any direct sun inland. It, just like that one strong beam on a hot day of direct sunlight could be enough for it to kind of fry at the edges. So this really is for true shade canopy, not even like on that northern exposure where you get that you know, sun part of the year. And then the last note is, and if you stick to the plants that I recommended or the things on the Inland Valley Garden Plan or that Calscape website, you will not plant invasive plants. But as you choose your plants, it's important not to plant invasive plants in our yard, even though some of them are pretty. So things like fountain grass or Mexican feather grass or pampas grass uh, are some of our top invasive plants. And the problem with those is that they are so well adapted to life here that they can spread to local ecologies. And what makes them invasive and not just non-native is that they can continue to spread and displace native plants, take their habitat, change things. Uh, fountain grass is such a big problem in our local hills and mountains that it actually has changed the fire ecology because they grow so fast in the spring that they can outgrow our native plants, but then they dry up in the summer in a way that the traditional native plants from those areas don't, and so make those areas more fire prone. And so important not to plant native plants, and we will end by leaving this list up of the top places to find these and similar plants in our local areas of 
This is Inland Empire into kind of Los Angeles area. And so that's, that's kind of it. Uh, today was all about plants. If you haven't taken our landscape design classes, I encourage you to check out the uh, online workshop recordings that we have because then you can combine these individual plants with ideas about kind of larger design and thinking about your needs and goals of the project. And so with that, I have plenty of time, even though we've reached the formal end of the workshop to answer any questions. I see a couple have come in, which I will answer in just a second, but also uh, for those of you who need to leave, before you leave, if you could please fill out this closing poll that helps us get our tracking metrics for the program. Also, I always really love to get any feedback you're willing to share in the chat. There's always a lot to cover. So if there's any thing that you learned today or not necessarily any plants, but any parts of the approach to teaching the subject that you found really useful, I always like to hear that in the chat. That's very useful because I'm always trying to tweak things or change things and then I can know to keep certain things the way they are or if there's anything you were hoping to get out of today that you didn't get, uh, I always really appreciate hearing that sort of feedback as well, because I can try to figure out a way to connect people with that information in the future, whether it's this workshop or if we need to develop another workshop or resource. And so with that, let's answer the couple of questions that I have. Okay, from Jeannie, what about Matiaha poppy and where to plant it? Matiaha poppy, is an excellent plant for certain things. Uh, it has, it's sometimes called fried eggplant. It has these huge white kind of crepe paper flower petals and this dark yellow center. And there's a reason why it was not on this list of favorite plants, even though it is so amazing. And it's because it spreads extremely aggressively more aggressively than I would recommend for the average home gardener. Uh, it spreads by roots so aggressively that I have read stories of it sending its roots all the way underneath the house from the front yard and coming up in the backyard. I have read stories of the it sending roots down and underneath the house with a uh, dirt kind of like semi-basement and trying to come up in the basement. If you are growing the Tiaha poppy, it will continue to spread outward from the roots if it's happy every year by multiple feet. And so you do just have to plan to start ripping it out uh, when it gets larger than you want. And it will require work every year in most cases to keep it in check. And it normally does also, to keep it looking good in the garden, have to get cut all the way to the ground most years, which can be a lot of work and a lot of material to have to do something with. And so with those caveats, uh, well-drained soil, full sun is pretty much all it needs to be happy. And, uh, you know, that same uh, irrigation once a week the first year, and then maybe once a month after that, although you might be able to get away with even less. So this is a plant that literally I have had arguments with my partner about who is also a professional horticulturist about whether or not we have the space in the garden to plant it. Uh, we finally have a big enough backyard that we both agree that we can grow it, but it's in the far bottom corner of our yard and has already grown incredibly wide from two years ago, maybe when we, we planted one. Uh, and next year we're gonna have to start doing size control every year. But it is amazing when it's flowering. So if you have the space and you're willing to do the work, go ahead and plant one. Uh, from George, what could happen if I planted the grape right up against the house? Uh, well, so a grape needs, uh, a, that grape, any grape needs a decent trellis. And so uh, it's just that when the fruit is fully ripe, it might attract ants, which I generally try to keep not up against my house. And it does need a significant amount of pruning every year. So if it's right up against the house, you're really going to need to be on top of that. So how many, let's see, how many of the foxtail agave will have typically in the normal garden conditions before it starts uh, to bloom and die? 
Uh, okay, so okay, so from George. So most most agaves are what's called uh, monocarpic, meaning they will not flower and they'll grow and grow and grow. And then they will have a huge, beautiful flower once and then they will die. But certain agaves like the foxtail agave are clumping agaves, meaning you'll plant one, but after a number of years, there's many other small rosettes at the base of that agave. And those will continue to grow as well. And so with agaves like the foxtail agave, what happens is when the one rosette blooms, that will die. But all of the little other rosettes at the base, sometimes called pups, will continue to live. And so after that dies back, you, with a pruning saw, will cut out the one that died back, but then you have all of those pups. Depending on the look you're going for, the amount of work you want to do, et cetera, et cetera, you might just be able to cut out the one that died and leave the rest to keep growing in. Or you can kind of dig everything up and the pups, as long as they just have a little bit of root on them, can be separated and then replanted in the ground kind of as a new planting. But you should generally have all the material you need to continue having a planting of the foxtail agave. And the, the number of years, it really depends. But normally you have a, 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 a decent number of years before it will start to bloom. So hopefully that helps. Uh, and those are the last of the questions. Thank you everybody for joining us today. And with that, I will say, uh, if you don't get our newsletter, please sign up for our newsletter. I'll type that into the chat right now, cbwcd.org slash newsletter. You can hear about all our upcoming workshops and events. And have a good rest of your weekend and come visit us. It's springtime. It's beautiful out here at the Waterwise Community Center in our demonstration garden in Montclair. Have a good rest of your weekend, everybody.